Deinonychus lived in the early Cretaceous period, after Allosaurus and before Tyrannosaurus Rex. One of the most fearsome hunters wasn't big at all. He measured close to ten feet long and only five feet tall. Deinonychus, with oh. his powerful jaw. Deinonychus, oh. with his terrible claws. When they fight a likely foe, they race to the attack. I actually really like this song. With his powerful Look jaw, here. Dynamicus. With his terrible This song slides. His arms were long to hold his prey, sharp claws were used to grip. But the deadly claw was on his foot, the one he used to rip. Dynamicus. With his powerful jaw, Deinonychus, with his terrible claws. He was a just big dinosaur, but will the sound of praise. I must have been the very fierce hunter of the sword, Deinonychus, with his powerful jaw, Deinonychus. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here, and thank you for that follow there, Second Breakfast, SBC. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. You're probably new here, and chances are we've got some other new folks here, too. Let me introduce myself real quick before we talk about what we're doing today on stream. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I study dinosaurs. I publish on them in the scientific literature. I dig up dinosaurs out in the field like we were doing this summer. Check out the YouTube page if you want to see those live streams. I was live streaming from uh, Wyoming and Utah this year, digging up at least three new species of dinosaur. Probably closer to double that, actually. But uh, we're going to be safe with it and say at least three new species of dinosaur. Anyway, on weekdays, when I'm not in the field, I'm here streaming on Twitch from my office. The whole point of these broadcasts is to do science outreach, to, uh, to talk to you good folks about paleontology. This is what I'm passionate about, and I'm super grateful to have the opportunity to, to share that passion with you and uh, answer your questions, try and instill uh, an appreciation for the world around us in our its incredible 4.54 billion year history of planet Earth. There's been life on Earth for about 3.5 billion of those years, and we talk about that here on Paleontologizing. So if you've got questions about Maybe dinosaurs in particular, since that's what I study, that's what I work on, that's my specialty. But uh, if you've got questions about broader topics in paleontology, about the history of life on Earth, about the fossil record, about extinction and evolution, and the very philosophy of science, um, don't hesitate to ask those questions. Those are the bread and butter of our stream here. And your good questions make these broadcasts what they are, so don't be shy. Anyway, today, we are going to be talking about Ineosaurus if Gimpleg shows up. Gimpleg, are you here right now? I failed to get to your dinosaur deep dive from yesterday, so I will do that if and when you get here. And also, we'll be talking about horseshoe crabs a bit because... 
our horseshoe crab, which we were printing yesterday, is now complete. Well, mostly. The rest of it just finished a few minutes ago, and it is over on the 3D printer right now. So I'll get that off of there, and we'll go ahead and assemble it in just a few minutes. And we'll start printing a dinosaur skull. Yeah. Looks awesome. Thanks, Valent. I appreciate that. It still needs to be painted, and the seams need to be uh, sanded and filled. I had a print failure last night. It's kind of my own fault. I, uh, I underestimated how much filament this was going to take, and it ran out in the middle of the night. So uh, I had to figure out a way to uh, re-slice a new file, and... Uh, we got the nose on this bad boy right here. On that, uh, what's it called? Cephalothorax carapace? We'll be talking about these terms, and we'll be talking about horseshoe crabs in just a little bit. But yeah, uh, Quab says, Will 6-2. Yeah, well, as I said yesterday, the horseshoe crab is a tricky creature because, well, let me, uh, let's talk about horseshoe crabs. A little bit, shall we? Uh, they're, uh, they're tricky, tricky animals. So the horseshoe crab here, despite its name, is neither a crab, nor is it a horse, nor is it a shoe. It's actually related to uh, other arthropods like arachnids. You can't enjoy science alone. You have to share it. And sysadmin, thank you for the three months of support. I appreciate that very much. Um, thank you, Sysadmin. So yeah, horseshoe crab. Not a horse, not a shoe, not a crab. But uh, a different group of animals called uh, chelicerates. They're related to, to wonderful, beloved animals like ticks and mites and spiders. You probably should love spiders, actually. Spiders are very helpful creatures. Um, and they're cool. I wish I liked spiders more, but they kind of creep me out a little bit. Just like horseshoe crabs kind of creep me out a little bit. Arthropods, not my favorite animals, but I'm trying to grow my appreciation for them because they are very important, and there's a good chance that your life has been saved by a horseshoe crab in the past without you even realizing it. We'll talk about why. Yeah. They've been around for a very long time, Fossil, but yes, indeed. Horseshoe crabs have been around for, like... Depending on how you count it, and what you consider a horseshoe crab, do you consi consider their distant ancestors to be horseshoe crabs? If they look fairly similar, I'd say, yeah, you might as well. They've been around for like half a billion years. These animals, their fossil history is incredible. So yeah, yeah. And they have very special blood. Wet Duke will be talking about that too. We will be talking about that too. And HD, are they good with drawn butter? I don't know what drawn butter is, HD. Um, I'd say they're good regardless. These are cool critters. They're very cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And fossil vet. Interesting. Maybe we'll talk about that later. What is this about? Um, hmm. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Let's talk about these critters a little bit. But first, let's let's get that off the printer, shall we? We got an amazing 70 million year old dinosaur egg, and they're perfectly preserved. Cephalime. Uh oh, what's that kid doing? Look out! There's a dinosaur behind you. Cephalime, where? Oh right. Yeah. We, we tend to have those here in the office. Um, shoot, how many dinosaur skulls do I have here right now? Including ones on skeletons. Let's see. Velociraptor, Deinonychus, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, plus a mammal skull. And I've got an Allosaurus skull over here. That's what? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 24 different dinosaur skulls so far. You know, let's bring over the, um, 
Allosaurus skull, shall we? And that kid is just performing histology. Yeah, glue is cheap, right, Mayor Space? <laughs> here, give me just a minute. Let's get this Allosaurus skull over here. have a 3D printed dinosaur egg, but it's in storage right now. Um, yeah, it's the biggest egg laid by any dinosaur ever. Does anybody know what it is? size Allosaurus skull. If this is new to anybody, then, uh, if this is new to anybody, then, uh, introducing Allosaurus, the, uh, most common big theropod dinosaur from the late Jurassic of North America, of course. Uh, of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. It's true. Yeah. Um, good evening to you too, Gamer L, and thank you for the 11 months of support. I appreciate that very, very much. Thank you kindly. It's wonderful. I appreciate you for it. Good stuff. Yeah. That's true. Didn't occur. Successful group would dominate and it would last forever. How it almost happened with dinosaurs. Tommy Platicus, thank you for the nine months of support. Thank you, thank you. And howdy, howdy, you too. How are you doing? Yeah. Uh, looks like the Alice is singing us a song. Put the microphone right up to it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, anyway, good stuff. Here, let's go like this. That should work. Yeah. Or even... Here. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. Cool. Um... Yeah. Mayor Space says the skull with the RGB light in it makes me think it would be cool to do laser tag in a natural history museum. That's an idea, Mayor Space. Hmm. I think just most things are cool in a natural history museum. You can't ask for a cooler setting than that, really. Um, so yeah, I would agree. As long as nothing gets damaged, then uh, that would be kind of neat, actually. There are different museums that hold like a sleepover in a museum kind of deal. I don't know if I've ever seen laser tag, though. Let's see if... Uh... Let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. What is this? Well, well, well. Pick a mattress, set up camp, and snuggle in. Whatever you do, though, don't wake the dinosaurs. <laughs> An unusual twist the That's Diplodocus. That's Dippy the Diplodocus right there, whose skull we're going to be printing eventually here. Um, I might need to get, well, I will need to get some more filament for that. Um, we'll see how much is left over after our coelacanth print. But, uh, yeah, we'll be printing the skull of Dippy. Right there, yeah. It's going to be big, too, like... It's about the size of a full-size horse's skull. History Museum yeah. has decided to open its doors for an adult sleepover. 120 people have paid almost $300 to spend a night sleeping wow. on the 
prehistoric fossils. It is exactly what I dreamt about, so it's perfect. <laughs> it's okay with the lights on, but I think it might be a little bit more airy with the lights off, so we're looking forward to things coming alive tonight. It's all mm. part of efforts by the museum to raise extra funds for scientific research and, of course, bring ah. the through the door. The huh. general public came up with the idea. Every time we advertised the children's sleepover, which has been running for four years, we would... I assume this is how the staff at the Natural History Museum in London usually dresses. I assume this is the, the year-round uniform, of course. We'd get tweets and emails and phone calls from people who wanted to come without any children. Tickets aren't cheap, but you get more than a mattress for the night. Guests are treated to a three-course dinner, stand-up comedy, live music, and for those with the stomach for it, an insect tasting session. Quite salty. Mm. Like some like packet of fish. It's all right. Again, I assume this is you know, traditional uh English cuisine. Uh yeah. <laughs> it does sound like fun. Ghostly ghoul? Yes. Uh, this is from nine years ago. I wonder if they have anything like this nowadays. I, uh, I'm not sure. Here's the head. <laughs> I'm vegetarian as well. <laughs> a and H also does pricey sleepovers. Is that right, Kennedy? Huh. Century, the cathedral -like yeah. Is something Musega says, us Brits invented food. <laughs> um, I'm sure, yeah. Great Britain is the cradle of humanity, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Homo sapiens first evolved on Great Britain. Yes? No. But, uh, <laughs> appreciate you, music. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, we're not going to fund you going over there so you can 3D scan all the things while people sleep. <laughs> Darn it! Dinosaur Dave, you spoiled my plan. ...of a British institution. It plays host to 70 million natural history specimens. Entry is usually free, but special events like this help to fund maintenance and research projects. There we go. Ooh, ooh who is this? Which theropod skull is this Cryolophosaurus, maybe? But what's wrong with the crest? That's not quite right. What's going on here? Who is this supposed to be? It looks like it's supposed to be Cryolophosaurus. Yeah. Oh. I think it is supposed to be Cryolophosaurus. Well, they didn't quite get the notch right in the jaw. The crest, it's got to be Cryolophosaurus. Yeah, whatever it is, it eats elves. There you go, HG. Yeah. I think most theropods would gladly eat an elf, and that includes modern theropods. Yeah. 350 scientists working in the museum every day um, with very active and very current research taking place all the time. So the profits from the event go back into the museum's work to support that. It's certainly hmm. a novel way to go about raising extra funds. If it takes your fancy though, there is another chance to come and sleep with the beasts in January. An acquired taste to be sure, but then it's not every day you get a chance to sleep in the shadow of a 26 metre Diplodocus skeleton. Hmm. Rosie Tompkins, CNN, London. That is pretty cool. Laser tag in a place like this would also be cool, as Mayor of Space pointed out. But, uh, yeah. And that wasn't just the pointy eyebrow things. They're called lacrimal horns or lacrimal crests on Allosaurus right here. Those are over the eyes. This it was like coming off of the frontal bone of the animal here. Let's scooch back. And research project. There we go. Yeah, so these are the lacrimal crests right here on this animal. And then this protuberance is... Looks like it is part of the same object. I think this is supposed to be Cryolophosaurus. But just like a weird model of it. Not quite right. Yeah. Um... Projects. Anyway. Yeah. ...working in the museum every day. Um, with very active... Anyway, cool stuff. Um, Diplodocus skeleton. Rosie Tompkins, CNN, London. Uh, 
I gotta say, I've got some uh, dinosaur fossil 3D prints where I sleep, and so I kind of get to do this every night, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> although it's not the original cast of Dippy like that, but we will be 3D printing a cast of, or a scan of Dippy's skull. Let me find that for you here. Dippy skull. There we go. Yeah. Um, this is the size for that. This is how big it's going to be. The skull of Diplodocus. And, uh... Here is the 3D model right here. Check it out. I've got to cut it down into multiple pieces to get it to fit on that print bed. But it's going to be pretty neat. I am excited about that. But I'm going to need some more filament because we actually just ran out of our... Um, of our silk brown filament trying to get this so I can show you properly, but I guess I can't drag the print bed up or down. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. I'm really excited about this. Yeah, it is a big skull, but you know, it's smaller than this one. So it will take a long time to print, but uh, not as long as this one did. Yeah. Anyway, that'll be something to do... Maybe after we print our coelacanth. We'll have to see. Coelacanth is going to be roughly the same size. Yeah. Anyway, pretty neat. Um, yeah, and if you'd like to contribute to that in a direct and material way, I've got a bunch of 3D printer filament on the wish list. You can check that out in the chat. Prehistoric fact. And the reactor is critical. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Um, I like your username. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, gonna need a bigger shelf? Yeah, Red I mean, I'm gonna have to start... ...cycling things out every once in a while, you know? Um, and I will put some more shelves up there. And I might even be moving... ...to, uh, a different office... ...sometime in the next few months. So... ...if I do end up moving, there will be more space. Uh, I hope. We'll see. Anyway. Back to our horseshoe crab. Let's go ahead and pull the last piece of that off of the 3D printer, and let's get that assembled, and let's talk about horseshoe crabs, what makes them special, and, uh, talk about why a paleontologist would be excited about horseshoe crabs, of all things. Um. Oh, very cool, Reactors Critical. Ex-Navy Nuke Submariner, hence the name. Holy cow, reactor is critical, that's pretty cool. Were you on a, an SSN or an SSBN? You know, a Hunter Killer or a Boomer? Let me know if you're at liberty ow, to discuss. Ouch. I just pricked myself with a bit of filament on here as I was running my thumb over it. Yowza. That hurt. And went under my thumbnail. Ouch! Ah. Anyway. Um. But yeah. All right, Lenina. I'll see you in a bit too. Thank you for everything you do. And uh, how much to spend the night at your place, Danny? I'm not running an Airbnb here, HD. Yeah. And uh. Besides, I'm. Not that kind of girl, HD. What are you talking about? Um. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I did get stung by a horseshoe crab. They don't actually sting, despite the, uh. Despite that sharp tail. Let's go pull this off the printer and let's get it glued onto here. Yeah. Um. 
Let's do that. Alright. There we are. Pulled off the print bed. The tail. It's not actually called a tail. It's got a different name. We'll find out what that is. Again, I'm a dinosaur guy. I don't study invertebrates. Um, but let's... Uh, let's get that glued on there. And then we're going to start a new print. Um... Caveman and the Missing Link. You mean that that uh, stop motion film? Mav Cave 14. That came out a while ago. Is today the anniversary or something? Well, why do you ask? Anyway, Helson, thank you, Musaica. That is what this dealie is called. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about that there, shall we? Um. Mm -hmm. I guess this is it here. Let's take a look. You're looking at a species that has managed to survive for a half a billion years. Uh-oh. Not ideal. Uh, what's wrong with that statement right there, chat? Did you hear it? Let's, let's go back one more time. You're looking at a species that has managed to survive for a half a billion years. Hmm. A wombat hole, thank you for the nine months of support. Crab people? <laughs> We're crab people now? A wombat hole, thank you for the nine months of support. I really appreciate that. Um, what, what was wrong with that statement here? Yeah. Andy already got it. Um... Here. Ding, ding, ding. I, uh... You, you're right. It's not the same species. This is not the same species that exist, has existed for half a billion years. Species change over time. They evolve. They split. They branch. They... Anagenesize. They, you know... They evolve from one species into another in a straight line sometimes without branching. But it's not the same species that lived half a billion years ago. There have been probably thousands of species. At least hundreds throughout that interim. You know? So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's not the same species. Um, there have been a lot of different species of horseshoe crabs over the last few hundred million years. It's not just one. In fact, even today, there's multiple species of horseshoe crab. I mean, shoot. Let's look at them. Then we'll watch the video and then I'll glue these on. Uh, at a restaurant, I mean. Okay, there you go, Terry Toe. Horseshoe crab. There we go. Zoom in and see them. You'll see they're pretty close to the ticks and mites and spiders. Up here. And scorpions and relatives, too. Yeah. Um. There we go. Marostomata are modern horseshoe crabs. There are 13 species alive today. 
They are cool critters. There's the Atlantic Horseshoe Crab, which I believe is the one that I just printed. This is going to be a challenge to paint, because uh, they've got such cool, subtle coloration like that. It's going to be pretty neat. Yeah. They are neat, Neutral Gnome. What a great name, by the way. Welcome to Paleontologizing. You'll think they're even cooler after you watch this video while I prepare this for printing. You're looking at a species that has managed to survive for a half a billion years. They've figured out how to harmonize with their environment in order to last that long. Well, it's, it's the long-lived lineage. This is actually an insane time for horseshoe crabs. People come from all over the world to see them, particularly in the Delaware Bay region, where that's yeah. pretty much the epicenter of horseshoe crab spawning in the United States. Do we have anybody from that part of the world here in chat right now? Are you lucky enough to live where the horseshoe crabs live to this very day? Uh. But the concentration that we have here is larger than any other place in the world. You do it very cool. Kennedy Sculpin, nice. They're done on the same night. They're done in the same way, year after year. We have a, a one meter quadrat, a square, putting it down every 20 meters, and we're counting the males and females that are within that quadrat. They don't just rush up on the beach, hey, look, it's high tide, <laughs> lay a bunch of eggs. That doesn't pay off. <laughs> Science, you gotta love it, you know? Um, some people think that I'm a little bit informal with my delivery of information sometimes here on stream, but I'm not the only one, you know? They don't just rush up on the beach, hey look, it's high tide, <laughs> lay a bunch of eggs. That doesn't <laughs> pay off. The females yeah. require sand that's lubricated with water to a certain degree so that they can mm -hmm. dig through it and they also need it dry enough that they can create a cavity under themselves into which they release a batch of eggs. So she's going to lay about a, a cluster of eggs that's maybe about the size of a golf ball. There'll be about four or 5,000 eggs in there. And then after she's laid those, you'll see her eggs. plow forward, go down a little bit, and do it again, and then she'll do it again, and she'll do it again, maybe four or five times in one tide for about 20,000 eggs. Very cool. For every female that you'll see on a spawning tide, there are several males. She won't come ashore to spawn unless she has a male clipped onto her. Hmm. But there are other males that are jostling around because by doing things right, they can achieve some paternity during spawning. They sort of game the system. The pharmaceutical biomedical industry uses a test that's made from the blood of the horseshoe crab. Yep. To determine whether there's any kind of bacteria that would cause an infection, a fever, and cause us to die. So that's why I said that chances are many people who are watching right now, who are watching this broadcast live currently in the present moment, their lives are probably saved by a horseshoe crab at some point because of this. To die. Anything that's injected into our system, anything that comes in contact with our blood, that includes even the needle, the saline solution, uh, spinal fluids like epidurals, anything that comes in contact with those systems. The blood of horseshoe crabs can be taken from the crab without causing 100% yes. mortality. In fact, the mortality is about 30% of the bled crabs. Shoot, I wouldn't even want to experience 30% mortality, though, for being honest but I guess it's a really important application, you know? And those yeah. crabs that have been bled are released within 24 hours of capture. I feel this anticipation every year when the horseshoe crabs are starting to come to shore to spawn. We, we've got a lot of measures in place that are already starting to bear fruit from the declines that we had back in the 90s, but mm. we still have a, a ways to go before we feel that the population is healthy and robust. No, I'm, I'm Assembling these 3D Every printed bits, they're HD, yeah. Come up onto the beach. I'm watching something that has played out for millions and millions and millions of years, and I'm just in awe. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool.
Um, yeah. Uh, and there you go, Mayor Space. I do have a more functional water bottle, but, uh, yeah, yeah. But the, uh, measuring cup has become, you know, a staple of this broadcast. Um, you'll notice there's no ice in it right now, because a few weeks ago, the ice started tasting really bad coming out of the freezer in my apartment. I replaced the water filter on the fridge slash freezer. The ice still tastes really bad, especially when it melts. So either we've got the lead pipes are acting up again, or some, I don't know. So I'm just going without ice for now. Um, but yeah, I'm going to glue this onto here. The end of the... Telson, I believe it's called. Is that right? Um, here. In the meantime, take a look at this. The Horseshoe Crab. It's a living fossil that has called Earth its home for almost half a billion years. It's out as a as a group, a lineage, yes. Mass extinctions and ice ages, but today it's facing a new threat. Their adaptations have worked with the way the Earth has changed, and it's only in recent years, with the with humans bringing impacts to their population, that they've started to have declines. Rising sea levels have bringing impacts to their population. I mean, that's one way to put it. Bleeding them dry, vampirizing them. That's another way to put it too. Yeah. Tat loss and over harvesting all threaten the population. But if you've ever had a vaccine, injection, or a medical implant, then you might not know that you've been relying on this prehistoric creature's blood to save your life. Now, after decades of waiting, a new synthetic solution could change all of that. Oh, really? Well, well, well. Here on our beaches on the Delaware Bay, it is a place that people are witnessing a phenomena that they cannot see anywhere else. It's the equivalent of the wildebeest crossing the Serengeti. Huh. In May and June, here on, on the Delaware Bay, where we are right now, millions of crabs come out. And Someone in chat was recommending that uh, everybody who can, who can do this, go see it. Go make a pilgrimage and see the horseshoe crab spawning event. In the Delaware Bay. Who was that? But yeah, you were right. It is pretty cool. It's just like one of the one of the big cool events in nature on our planet. That was you, Neverwinter? Very nice. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, on a high tide, lay their eggs about six inches deep in the sand, and they will stay in the sand and hatch in about a month. And horseshoe crab eggs are a really critical part of the ecosystem here. If a single crab is laying almost 100,000 eggs, that is providing a food source for shorebirds, for gulls, for fish, for terrapins, and then all up the food chain for that. And then what happens with the horseshoe crabs then trickles down to the whole ecosystem. Terrapins, is that right? Are they sea turtles terrapins? To evolve I think terrapins are a different kind of turtle, aren't they? The oceans and the changing land. The reason this crab Maybe she meant colonians or so testudines. It's blue blood. This copper-based blood contains special cells called amoebocytes, which are extremely sensitive to endotoxins. These are contaminants released from the cell walls of harmful bacteria, and they can cause life-threatening fever or toxic shock. As soon as the amoebocytes detect any of these endotoxins... Terrapin is freshwater. That's what I thought, Musaic. Yeah. ...immobilizing it and protecting yeah. the crab from infection. In the 1960s, scientists found a way to harness this unique superpower. Mary Space says, I thought terrapin was just the British word for turtle. No, that's Shelly Welly. That's what they call them over there uh, in England. Oh. Yeah. To make sure our Is that right, Musega? ...free from contamination, <laughs> and it replaced slower, more unpredictable tests involving rabbits. Oh. The formula is called Limulus amoebocyte lysi, or LAL and relies on amoebocytes taken from horseshoe crab blood. And so every year, half a million crabs are collected along the Atlantic coast, as well as across the eastern shores of Mexico and China. Hmm. 
A third of the crab's blood is drawn before they're released back into the one ocean. One third of their blood. Imagine having, like, when you go to give blood, they take one third of your blood. And then they go throw you in the ocean afterward. It's estimated that 50% yeah, of crabs collected die as a result of this bleeding process. Uh, which could mean the loss of 75,000 crabs in the U.S. every year. How'd they pick one third? I don't know, HD. I'm not sure. An alternative was well, found, like however, pretty well almost on 20 years ago here in Singapore. Really? I didn't know that. In the past, say 20, 30 years ago, we managed to collect 30 pieces in one afternoon. But now, it is difficult to find a, even a few. In the mid-1980s, Professor Ding Jek Ling needed LAL for work involving IVF embryos. But there was a problem. Singapore research was not very well funded. So because the LA... Tell me about it. Shoot, this is a problem here in the States as well. ...was so expensive. We had to find a good way to understand how the Hashu crab blood works. So my research collaborator, also my husband, together with our research a students... science power couple, went cool. ...went to the Mud Flats to look for Hashu crabs and to bring a few samples back to the lab. We cleaned them, we tagged them, and we took only a small volume of the blood, isolating the blood cells from the Hoshu crab, and we could produce our own equivalent of LAL. This synthetic equivalent is called recombinant factor C, hmm. and it's a clone of the main gene in a horseshoe crab's blood, which is sensitive to bacterial endotoxins. Oh, cool. And it was a moment of uh, realization that it's going to change the biomedical industry. And it's hmm. going to save a very, very highly threatened species. Multiple species, really. It's not just one. So there's 13 the species left. Pharmaceutical companies didn't come around as quickly as Professor Ding had hoped. Mm. And so years and then decades passed. We're a highly regulated industry. And to say we would like to market a new medicine, a lot of people are reluctant to take a chance on, on trying something new. That's until a scientist at pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly, with a particular hobby, came along. Birding is a, a hobby of mine. Here, take a look. Where we talk about birding, very cool. Um, but check this out. Yeah. There's the Towson right there. The tail of this critter. Very nice. You can see there's multiple colors that I had to use because we ran out of this color right here. And I've got one spool left of the copper color before I run out of that too. Um, but I'm trying to make use of every last bit. And uh, thank you to the viewers who donated all of that 3D printer filament. You know who you are and I appreciate you tremendously. So thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, awesome. This is gonna look really, really cool when it's painted. So uh, yeah, let me get this glued on here. Let's, uh, let's continue. Industry, and to say we would like to market a new medicine, a lot of people are reluctant to take a chance on, on trying something new. That's until oh, a scientist at, at pharmaceutical company, Eli <laughs> Lilly, with a particular hobby, came along. Birding is a, a hobby of mine. So to go to Delaware Bay and see the horseshoe crab spawning, um, it, it kind of put it all together for me. So the, the horseshoe crab is a keystone species in its ecology obviously for its own sake but then for a lot of other animals that depend on it yep if we use RFC, like sandpipers there then then there aren't any crabs that are affected whether it's mortality or whether there's some behavioral effect uh, by taking by taking the blood studies have shown that the rfc test is a more effective and a potentially cheaper solution than lal changing really? minds however remain the biggest challenge mm. There's been several times I, I was I was ready to throw in the towel, so it's been uh, it's been a difficult journey um, to fight internally to fight externally. Nobody likes change, but we think we're doing it for the right reasons. Um, we have had success, and we do we have the data at the end of the day. Persistence paid cool. off. 
and in 2018, the first drug to use the recombinant factor C test was approved by the FDA. Oh yeah, all right. Transition 90% of its tests to the synthetic by the end of 2020. I think the consequence- Okay, I hope that's happened. On ...with bleeding crabs is that at some point there won't be any. So there Ugh. are real impacts to what we're doing and, and the longer we say, oh, you know, they'll be available forever, it's, it's, it's likely not true. No, it's not true. It Again, creatures that have been around for half a billion years humans are like could disappear if we keep bleeding them, protecting literally. Protecting biodiversity and not impacting biodiversity. The yeah. synthetic version of the horseshoe crab lysate used by pharmaceutical industry is going to have a major impact on horseshoe crab conservation. It's not the only factor that we need. We also need to continue with harvest limits and with beach restoration, but reducing the need to harvest crabs for the use of their blood will have a major impact. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Um, oh, and Red Knot's populations are decreasing rapidly. Is that a... Uh, it's got to be a species of, uh, of littoral... Maybe shorebirds, right? Neverwinter? Yeah. Anyway. Check this out, chat. Holy cow, this makes me really happy to be able to hold this. Um, my own horseshoe crab right here. Again, neither a horse, nor a shoe, nor a crab. It's a very special kind of creature. It's, uh, it's pretty neat. Here, one more video about horseshoe crabs before we move on. Every year, East Coast beaches play host to one of the world's wildest parties. Hmm. It's all sex and gluttony on the shore. Okay, okay, calm down. These spring breakers are of the ten-legged variety. Millions of prehistoric creatures converge here. What's behind this epic fiesta? Well, about 500 million years of evolution is what's behind it. Yeah. The waters of Delaware Bay look unassuming. But as the temperatures warm in spring, something curious happens. Strange <laughs> creatures emerge from the depths. These ancient beings are horseshoe crabs. Yep. Horseshoe crabs spend most of their lives in the deep ocean. But every May and June, millions of these creatures drag themselves ashore on sandy beaches up and down the Atlantic coast. Some will travel 60 miles or more just to get here. While aerial views of these creatures are pretty cool, we want to take you even closer. Hmm. So we teamed up with our friends at Deep Look to show you this. Wait, so... There's a different PBS channel that looks at things up close instead of looking at them from far away? Did I catch that? <laughs> That just seems so funny to me. It's like, oh, no, we don't do that. We only look at things through drones and, you know, like, you know, we're more of a big picture kind of channel, like literally. Um, hmm. So we teamed up with our friends. Yeah, reanimated bit. They're super cool this. critters. Horseshoe crabs. Yeah. Ugh, they're not the prettiest crabs, animals. They're actually more closely related to spiders and other arachnids than to crabs or lobsters. Yeah. They're beautiful in their own way. The concentration of horseshoe crabs greater than here in Delaware Bay. <laughs> as many as 30 million macro and micro PBS. There you go, reanimated. Yeah. The size of Shanghai, <laughs> China, descend on the bay. Wow. But what wow. Are doing here? Look at all of those. That's nuts. Look at that. I hope these aren't all dead. No. Look at that though. These beaches wow. are the ultimate horseshoe crab hookup spot. Male crabs arrive just ahead of the females. They form a wall that females must plow through to reach suitable nesting sites. Hmm. They jostle until one lucky male successfully grabs onto the female's shell. Not more than you've ever seen, Kennedy. Yeah, that's crazy. I didn't Each realize there were. Will carry upwards of eighty thousand eggs. 
she Baby buries Jasmine. them in the sand, which her suitors fertilize. The females burrow into the sand, so she is almost completely covered up when she's making those nests. And the males are on the surface of the sand and surrounding it. They like to spawn to fertilize high eggs, on yeah. the beach. The theory is that that was a strategy to avoid aquatic predators. To do that, the crabs need to arrive when the tides are highest, around the new and full moon in May and June. It sounds like one of those bronze. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you learned this in horseshoe crab school. Um, around the new moon in May and June, the crabs arrive to spawn and swoon. Around the new and full moon in May and June. Only a handful of the thousands <laughs> of eggs a female lays will even survive a year. Yeah. Fewer yet will survive to sexual maturity. So this is what we call an our strategy in biology where you it's quantity over quality in terms of your offspring you know an elephant has one offspring every couple years maybe horseshoe crabs will have tens of thousands every year so quantity over quality that's an r strategy the elephant strategy or the human strategy uh, where you've got a few offspring and you take very very good care of them that's called the k strategy is R and K. I'm sure those have some sort of mathematical significance, those two uh those two letters, but it's over my head. Yeah. You just have to buy a lot of lottery tickets to have a chance Or spoons. To there you go, HD, yeah. <laughs> it's a strategy that served them well for a long, long time. Yeah. They're older than dinosaurs. If you saw a fossil much older. Uh, Holy cow. cow from hundreds of millions of years ago, you would recognize that as a modern day horseshoe crab. So it's I mean, unless you're a horseshoe crab researcher, then you'd go, what, what is, what's wrong with this horseshoe crab? Oh, it's from hundreds of millions of years ago. They look very, it's not like they've gone unchanged. I mean, if a creature, I want to, I want to emphasize this point very, very heavily here. Okay. So heed my words. If a creature, be it a horseshoe crab, or a cycad plant, or a Watson bird, or a whatever else, a living fossil, a coelacanth fish, it's not that they've gone unchanged for uh, millions of years. They're constantly changing. If you're a species that's still around, that means that you're changing generation to generation. Evolution is constantly changing. It's not like these creatures have not evolved. They certainly have. Just to us, superficially, they look very similar to some of the ones that, uh, you know, that existed tens or hundreds of millions of years ago. So... Let's look at a horseshoe crab fossil. Yeah... So there's one, a fossil on the left, and then a modern horseshoe crab on the right. There are going to be significant differences between them, though. It might look superficially similar, but if you're the sort of person who studies horseshoe crabs, you'd go like, wow, holy cow, that looks way different. This one looks way different. Look at the, uh, uh, the carapace on the top. That, uh, cephalothorax. Very different shape from what you see right here. So this is a lineage of creatures that goes back very far, but it's not like they've gone unchanged. Dinosaur man. Dinosaur man. <laughs> Displacer, thank you for the two months of support. I appreciate that, Displacer. Welcome back. It's good to have you here. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And birds do eat a lot of horseshoe crab eggs. Absolutely never winter full, yeah. Yeah. And Sylphurian says, keep in mind that we were just like them millions and millions of years ago. Well, I mean, uh, humans weren't around millions and millions of years ago. Our ancestors were, but we're kind of a new thing on this scene. You know? Yeah. And these are not a type of sea scorpion. They're what we call 
Well, here, let's let's talk about them. There's our horseshoe crabs right there, Marrow Stomata. And they are related, of course, to arachnids and their relatives. Spiders, mites, scorpions, and relatives. Sea scorpions, I think, are closer to actual scorpions. So I'm trying to zoom out here, and my scroll wheel is being all finicky. Um, yeah, so I think sea scorpions, eurypterids, would be closer to over here. But they are related to them. They're just not the closest relatives in the whole world, you know? Yeah. And Rizodega says, wait, they put scorpions in the sea too? Um, yeah, eurypterids. These were some of the first big oceanic predators. This is long before the dinosaurs. There were these critters cruising around doing their thing. Some of them got real big. Like these guys. Yeah. Uh, so they're related to scorpions today, but they're yeah, but they're different. They're older than land scorpions. Sea scorpions. I bet you I can find a video with uh, Nigel Marvin and a sea scorpion for like a documentary show. It's neat how they fake this. It was it's fun stuff. Um, Ripterid. There we go. Four hundred and fifty million years ago. No plants on land. Uh, so this is a, you know, a fun little dramatized documentary. Nigel Marvin goes back in time to various uh, points in Earth history when there were cool things swimming around in the seas. There's a lot less oxygen in the air then. Yeah. <clears throat> really nice guy. Oh, cool, Musaica. Yeah, I've never met Natural Marvin. Yeah. Yep. At an invertebrate show. Interesting music. Huh? Cool. Is an invertebrate show kind of like a dog show where you, you know, people trot around with their invertebrates and judges poke and prod them? Or is it more like, uh, like a trade show for invertebrates? Um, or maybe it's like a stage show starring invertebrates. I don't know. Let me know, Musica. It sounds interesting, whatever it is. <laughs> Phalo, there you go. <laughs> you buy them. Nine new tarantulas. Oh, gotcha, Musica. Okay. Cool. And what are those? What are those? Horseshoe crabs, chat. Horseshoe crabs. They've been around for about 450, maybe even 500 million years. Probably closer to 450. Yeah. Yeah. Best in show, the scallop. There you go, HD. Yeah. Hmm. Put some shoes on. There's sea scorpions about. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. 
TJ Girl says, is this real? No, this is from a documentary. That's CGI right there. And then this is an animatronic that he's holding. But pretty effective, right? I mean, it gets the point across. Yeah. Yeah. Reanimated Bit says, Danny, what do you think of speculative biology? Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty speculative. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think it happened. <laughs> reanimated bit <laughs> but yeah I don't know, it is what it is it can be fun sometimes I'm not super interested in it though oh boy yeah yowza yeah anyway sea scorpions the cool thing is horseshoe crabs have been around since this time I mean that's pretty awesome that these critters first evolved around this time. I mean, holy moly. That's pretty neat. Yeah. I choose not to speculate on that. There you go, ruler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, that one's bigger than a person. Uh, Jacob Terrace. Kelopterus. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. There we go. Yeah. Predatory Eurypterid. There we go. Uh, there's two known species. One from Germany. And one from Wyoming. So, yeah. Uh, the largest known Eurypterid and the largest known arthropod to have ever existed. Pretty cool. Yeah. So they could have been seven and a half to eight and a half feet in length. So, uh, 2.3 to 2.6 meters long. Pretty cool animal. So, yeah. When these critters were uh, doing their thing, horseshoe crabs were also doing their thing. Yeah. Fossil record for Xiphosaura, which is the group that horseshoe crabs belong to, goes back over 440 million years to the Ordovician period. Pretty neat. Yeah. And we don't have crustaceans nearly that large today, Grandis Duda, no. No, at least not in terms of mass. I know that uh, king spider crabs can get pretty big. They can be like eight feet across or something. But that's because of their long spindly legs. You know? Yeah. Um, and are horseshoe crabs related to trilobites? That's a great question, Harold the Four Gamer. Great question. They're... They're not as close to trilobites as they are to spiders, ticks, and mites. So these guys are not, like, true crustaceans. They're part of pan-crustacea because they are arthropods, I think. Wait, no, they're not even pan-crustaceans. They're outside of that. Anyway, our horseshoe crabs are right there. Closer to spiders, mites, scorpions, and relatives. Trilobites, I think, are true crustaceans, or were true crustaceans. They're, uh, they're extinct now. But, um, let's see. Um, let's see if we can find a phylogeny with these critters in them. Here we go. So here's Xiphosaurans. These are horseshoe crabs right here. And trilobites would be here inside of pancrustacea. 
So, horseshoe crabs are much closer to things like uh, wind scorpions, true scorpions, um, spiders and mites and critters like that. Does that make sense? They're closer to uh, to arachnids. In fact, they are a group of arachnids, I suppose. Yeah. So they're not they're not super close to trilobites. Um, but they did live at the same time, which is pretty cool to think about. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, they're both arthropods, but that's about it. There you go, Finboy, yeah. Correct. Anyway. I, uh, can't wait to paint this. That's gonna be super neat. Let's go back to our video about... Is it hell shoot clubs? There we go. To live it's a strategy that served them well for a long, long time. Yeah. They're older than dinosaurs. Much you older. Much, much older than dinosaurs. From hundreds of no contest. Years ago, you Not even close. As a modern day horseshoe crab. So it's a living fossil. There was a that term living fossil I have some quarrels with. It's not it's not a very good term. It's confusing because fossils are by definition dead. You can't be a living fossil, you know? Literally it, it's not possible. But oftentimes people use that term living fossil to denote a creature that looks prehistoric but is still around today. But in practice I mean, it turns out when you investigate all of these living fossils, whether they are ferns or cycads, club mosses, coelacanths, uh, or hoatsons, or horseshoe crabs, or whatever else, usually it just means that they're a group that's been around for a long time, and most of their relatives are extinct. So it's like they're, they're the last living remnants of a group that used to be more widespread. That's, I guess, what it means to be a living fossil. You could call them a relic, I suppose. Relict. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Step one, die. There you go, Miss Yvette. Yeah. <laughs> relic species. I mean, yeah. That's that's a term that I would, I would maybe use uh, rather than living fossil, which is kind of confusing. But, yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Irrefutable says it's poetic speech, maybe not compatible with scientific description. I would agree with you, except you do hear it often in, like, science documentaries, the term living fossil, or in, you know, it is it is more of a poetical kind of thing, but it still gets bandied around a lot in, like, popular science videos, books, documentaries, stuff like that. Living fossil, you know? Fossil of horseshoe crab from hundreds of millions of years ago. You would recognize that as a modern day horseshoe crab. So it's a living fossil. Yeah. There was a time, however, when their survival was in question. In the early 1900s, horseshoe crabs were harvested by the millions and used as fertilizer. That oh, practice geez. ended, but today they're harvested <sighs> for bait and for a different use. Their blue blood contains an ingredient critical to testing the safety of vaccines and other drugs. Cephalim, yeah. To prevent o Sometimes terminology like that just gets picked up because it sounds cool and people just keep using it and... Yeah, anyway. Over yeah. harvesting, a yearly survey is conducted around Delaware Bay. Researchers and citizen scientists team up to walk the beaches and count the crabs. Zero, zero. The horseshoe crab survey is the way for us to learn more about the population. Four males, zero females. There will be a recorder that will be the person in charge of taking notes and collecting the data. There will be a person rolling the quadrat, which is the method in which we randomize which areas of the beach. You know, they should really use a round one. It'd be easier to roll, you know, rather than a square one. in the quadrat, which is the method in which we randomize which areas of the beach we collect counts. One, two, three, four, five, six. Every time I see these crabs, I just go, this is so freaking cool. Horseshoe hmm. <laughs> crabs need big stretches of sandy beach area. Look at it's that.
Just look at them scooting around back there. That's so cool. Environment that's slowly disappearing around here with all of the development, so it is a big concern. For now, the population in Delaware Bay appears to be healthy and growing. That's a good thing, not only for the crabs, but for the other spring breakers. Like boids. Yeah. Up to a million migratory birds visit these shores on their way to Arctic nesting grounds. It's not just coincidence the crabs and the birds are here together. Because the birds are eating the, the crabs, crabs' eggs. It's mating time. But for the birds, it's the product of this mating that they're here for. Yep. Eggs. These tiny green gems are horseshoe crab eggs. They literally there you go, Atreus, yeah. mating season. Yeah. The and eggs these quadrants are essential like that all you can eat buffet for migratory birds. Some of these birds travel. Ruler says, I saw a documentary with that the other day. North Carolina regulates the number of horseshoe crabs that may be taken. And those that are captured for blood may only have a certain amount of blood extracted before they're released. Yeah, 30%. Uh, like one third, I guess. Ruler. Yeah. Yeah. For thousands of miles to get here, and their survival literally depends on this food. Shorebird migration is timed such that birds arrive in the Delaware Bay during the peak of horseshoe crab spawning. Hmm. The threatened red knot is one such traveler. There's the red knot mentioned in chat earlier. The southern tip of Very South cool. America all the way to the Arctic. Holy cow. Imagine that, a bird this big. A bird like the size of a, a small sandwich flies like a third of the way around the globe and then back every year. That's crazy. That's crazy. A journey of nearly 9,000 miles. Holy cow. Wait, shoot. How, how many miles was that? How many again? Over 9,000! That's crazy for such a small bird. Holy moly! It flies from the southern tip of South America all the way to the Arctic. A journey of nearly 9,000 miles. Near, nearly 9,000? That's, um... That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Should have a soundbite for nearly 9,000. When they arrive in the stop dedicated to the snacks. Bay, it's respectable, Risa Degu, yeah. Skinny and you can yeah. almost visibly... <laughs> It's under 9,000. There you go, mechanism. I ought to make a second one. Under 9,000. Yeah. Yeah. See their breastbone. These nutritious eggs are the fuel <laughs> needed to complete their migration. By the time they leave, they've blown up like a balloon that you could pop with a pin. Don't do that. When we think of migration, we think of these really incredible international events that wouldn't be happening right here in little old Delaware. <laughs> but like any good party, cool. the morning after can be a real drag. Mm. They have the ability, surprisingly, to be stranded after tide has retreated, hunker down, stay moist, wait for the next tide because they're their lungs they've got like really book gills on them so sometimes you think they're dead until you give them a little push and then when they start moving it's like oh good i can save this one <laughs> <laughs> it's almost addictive you say <laughs> i'm just gonna flip over 10 more and then you say well i can do another 10. <laughs> i really do take great pleasure in saving a big mama knowing that Aww. she will be able to lay eggs again because when you see the, how the birds rely on them, you know, it's all part of the circle of life. <laughs> That's beautiful. To get a more close-up view of these amazing little creatures, be sure to check out the latest episode from our friends at Deep Look. Very cool. Very cool indeed. Well, wow. horseshoe crabs, pretty neat animals. I'm really excited to have been able to 3D print this. And I'm uh, really excited to paint it. I'll show you the end result of that sometime soon, I hope. It'll probably be next week, I'm guessing. I'm going to be doing a, a tiny little spot of field work tomorrow morning, actually. So I won't have time before tomorrow's stream. 
nor will I have time on Friday morning, because I've been working on a talk that I'm going to be giving um, to a group of other paleontologists, so this will have to wait for maybe a week or two before we paint it. But it's really nice to have that printed. Anyway. Um, and Devil Reapers, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. You're asking what this community is all about? Well, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already, a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. When I'm not out digging up dinosaur fossils, like I was doing this summer, you should check out the YouTube page to see some of our fieldwork live streams, digging up dinosaurs live on stream. When I'm not out in the field, I'm here in my office. Uh, streaming five days a week, talking about fossil news, new discoveries in fossil science. Doing some 3D printing. 3D printer is quiet right now, but we're going to start printing another file very soon here. And, uh, and answering your questions. Q&A is really the biggest part of these streams, so I'm, I'm glad you could be here today. Welcome to Paleontologize. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Saggy Iguana says, how can we sign up for the talk? It'll be on YouTube later, I've been told, Saggy Iguana, so I'll, I'll share it with you later. Yeah. Uh, gonna have a nap? You sleep well, Smorphosaurus. Yeah, and welcome, Devil Reapers. Yeah. Let's put something else going on the printer. And thank you, Miss Yvette, for gifting Devil Reapers. I appreciate that very much. Look, we're at 56 out of 150 subs now for the week. Thank you, Miss Yvette. Thank you kindly. And uh, enjoy those emotes there. Emotes like these. Devil Reapers. Yeah. Um, who can tell me what this critter is? Right here. Hmm. What is this that we're going to be printing here? What a weird looking thing. What in the world is that? Hmm. It's a dinosaur, says Cephalon Wolf. Really bizarre. Not a T-Rex. Nope. Doesn't seem like anybody got it. It's not mammalian mechanism. This, dear viewers... is an Overaptorosaur. You probably know Overaptor. Yeah. That's the skull of an Overaptorosaur right there. This particular one is called City Patty. Oh, City Patty. Uh, its name might sound a little silly, City Patty. Especially when you say it with a Midwest accent. Oh, yeah, der, hey, City, City Patty. Oh yeah, we're gonna go down to the Johnson's place and we're gonna go watch the city piatti. Um, but yeah, this is an Overaptorosaur. You're probably familiar with Overaptor from Mongolia. This critter used to be called Overaptor, and then the uh, the good folks over at the American Museum of Natural History in New York decided it should be its own genus of dinosaur. They're not going to call it Overaptor anymore. It's different enough that they're going to call it something else. And they named it City Patty, which I believe is Mongolian for Funeral Pyre Lord. It's, uh, it's a cool name, actually. Here, let's see here.
Uh, let's see if I can find you a video. Well, this one isn't too shabby, I suppose. Yeah, they're called Overaptor in this. Yeah. <clears throat> they may not have been meat eaters. We're not totally sure what they ate. Yeah. City Patty. Um, pretty cool critter. City Patty. And, uh, actually, let me see if I can find that clip. Um... of the Gobi Desert. I think this is it. Um, this is from a lovely documentary back in the 90s. Here, let's take a look. Make sure that they're... They're groomed. It's Michael Novacek there. Fast at all times. Because you never know. There may be oh, bathing in the field. Affairs in a nearby village that you might need to attend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did they steal eggs? Probably not. Birds did it on, but there are only maybe every once in a while. Left. When in Rome, it's time. You know, when in Rome, you steal the Romans' eggs and eat them for nourishment, as they say. Um, I'm sure if given the opportunity, these guys would wolf down some eggs, but, uh, I'm yeah. for the second act of Romeo and Juliet. The Overraptors oh, await a sheltering great. shroud of rags and plaster. They're now in the skillful look at that hands in a bit, of preparator Lenina. Amy Davidson. Yeah. I love skeletons. I, I actually never was that into dinosaurs as a kid, but I've always loved bones, and, um, I have a, a background as a sculptor, and, um, I, I've always admired the skeletons that we all have inside us is some of the most beautiful sculpture on earth. And these fossil skeletons look almost as well preserved as, as yesterday's camel skeleton, but they're a dinosaur, <laughs> you know? There we go. I think forever. these are the ones that we're talking about here. Or no, this, I'm sorry, it's a different one. This is Romeo and Juliet here. Almost lasted forever. For 80 million years, Romeo and Juliet lay together, reaching toward each other in death. <laughs> this is a different kind of over after a sore. I think these have, these are, uh, no, shoot, what are these ones called? Darn it, I forget. They're not Con, they're not Ingenia, they're not uh, Conco Raptor. I tell you, these Overaptorosaurs in the late Cretaceous are probably oversplit. Um, but those aren't the ones we're looking for. We're looking for Big Mama here. Big Mama is City Patty. And where is... Where is Big Mama? Um, here, I think? Wonderful. <laughs> yes. That's nice. There's the claws. Nice. The side of the skull here. These are the teeth sticking You can see right these teeth, here. yeah. Each one of these is a socket for it. Oh, that's in Tibetan Buddhism. So that's not Mongolian language. That's something else mechanism. Uh, of the Himalayas, it is formed of two skeletal deities, one male and the other female, both dancing wildly with their limbs intertwined instead of a halo. Inside of a halo of flames representing change. That's that's hardcore mechanism. Thanks Jeez. for... Uh, yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah. Hand claw. Mm -hmm. Has this big uh, thing right here on it. Fossil vet. Thank you, thank you. For the 21 months of support. Really appreciate that, Fossil vet. I, I do, and I am still working on the, the Dromaeosaur puppet. I would like to be able to get that done before TwitchCon this year. But we shall see if that's possible. Um, Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you for your continued support, Fossil Vet. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And that was a starling right there. 
chat. Yeah, starlings are capable of amazing auditory mimicry. They can mimic all kinds of different sounds. It's it's really extraordinary. Retractor bulge, mm -hmm. and it's a hand of an over-raptor. They've hit the jackpot. Among their first finds are over-raptors. The yeah. creature Andrews knew as Egg Thief. That's it. That's it. Mm. Nice. Yeah, this is over raptor. Here's a big manal. Considering that over raptor is one of the rarest dinosaurs in the world, and <laughs> according to these guys, it probably still would be. <laughs> um, because they later determined this wasn't over raptor. I think there's only one specimen of over raptor that's ever been collected over after phylloceratops uh osborne described it in 1924 i think um i don't know if there's ever been another specimen of that animal published on I'm, there probably is i probably just there's don't only know there's been a handful of specimens yeah. found before we discovered this place where we found 25 i mean today we found at least oh and uh marissa how are you doing Marissa says, hey, Danny, Marissa from Ancient Odyssey's here. Keep up with the great info. Totally enjoying it. It is great to have you here, Marissa. I hope you're doing really well. Um, yeah. Holy moly. It is lovely to have you here. Welcome back. Shoot, we are just watching a quick little video on fieldwork in Mongolia. We're talking about over after a source. You know, why don't we go ahead and get this thing ready to print. This is an Overaptorosaur skull right here. This particular Overaptorosaur is called City Patty. And let's prepare this for 3D printing. Let me get the printer fired up and preheated so we can get on the fast track with this. Here's our 3D printer. All right, that's preheating. Let me grab the data card for it. And great to see you. I feel like you're talking right to me, because I am. Marissa, I am. Welcome. It's good to have you here. And Winja, thank you for the 10 months of support. I appreciate that, Winja, very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Here, let's, uh, let me grab that data card. There we go. Let's get this thing ready for printing. For those of you who aren't familiar with 3D printers and how they work, this might be instructive. Um, let's rotate on the, let's see, X axis. 90 degrees, is that right? There we go. And we're gonna split this down the sagittal plane right there. Right down the middle, just right there like that. Get that arranged on the print bed. Make sure we have these parts separated. Kind of a yin and yang thing here. Like this. So we've got both halves of the skull. And let's slice it. So what we do when we're slicing it is... Uh, we're having this program take that shape and translate it into data that the 3D printer can use. So it's working on it. It's working on it. And thank you, Lordy, for those 300 bits. How are you doing, Lordy? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. And hype train incoming? Excellent. Thank you, Lordy. Yeah. And why not print it as one? It is a messier print if I print it as one because... The way that this kind of 3D printer works, it needs supports underneath. So, first, a, a printer works kind of like a 
like a robotic hot glue gun. And uh, thank you, Ridla, for the 250 bits. Excellent. Appreciate that, Ridla. Yeah. Uh, so you'll see in a minute, the nozzle goes around and it lays down this, it, like, it melts this plastic filament onto the print plate like this. And then it slowly builds it up layer by layer like that. But since they're overhanging pieces, it needs supports underneath. And the supports are green in this visualization here. And so if I just printed the skull you know, standing up on end, we'd have all these supports inside of all these, like in between all of these bony struts. And it's just a big pain in the butt to try and remove those supports later. But if I do it like this, it's a lot easier to remove. Um, Here's you a know, step by step from to becoming a fossil. Step one, die. Bet Medler. Send something to the PO box today. Well, 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 Bet Medler. Thank you very much. I will have to check on that next week, huh? Thank you, Bet Medler. Appreciate you. And thank you for the 14 months of support too. Holy cow, 14 months. That's. It's almost a whole year, isn't it? Bet Medler, thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. This just makes it easier to remove those supports because I can I can pull them off of the undersides of each of these and then they'll be all clear and then I just glue it together like that. So this is going to take about 7 hours 40 minutes in order to... Uh, to print there. So I'm exporting this to our SD card. There we go. And then we go put this into the printer and we'll get it started. Let's do it. Now, I was having some issues with the 3D printer this morning. I actually spent a big part of my morning troubleshooting this thing. When I was finishing printing our, um, our horseshoe crab. Um, yeah, we we're running into some difficulties. So I'm going to keep a close eye on this and make sure that our first layer, which is the most critical part of the print, make sure that that goes well. If the first layer doesn't go well, then you're sunk. If it does go well, then you stand a pretty good shot at, um, at having a successful print. So yeah. Yeah. And... Thousand bits can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Ash Rubber, thank you so much. Go to help great science outreach. I appreciate that more than you know, Ash Rubber. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Holy cow. Thank you for uh, for helping keep me here on the air. It means a lot to me. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. And Lenina says, at least you can see it with my resin printer. I have to pause it to see if anything is going well. Oh boy, that doesn't sound like fun. You know, say what you like about PLA printers like this non-resin printers, but um, the simplicity and the fact that it doesn't smell like something awful I really like, even if it seems a bit more primitive. Ridla, thank you for the 250 bits. I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah everything's a trade-off, you know? Um, with a resin printer, you don't have to worry about supports as much. But, uh, but... You know, you got to deal with the resin that smells bad, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Blue wants to get a PLA printer. I get that, Lenina. Yeah. 
Can we show the dino news with Disney now, please? Ask Fossil Vet. Since you asked nicely, we can. I don't know what this is about quite, but we'll... We'll see here. Um... This is sent to me by Fossil Vet. Dino Land USA Transformation. Indiana Jones and... and can't, I don't know what that is. Coming to Animal Kingdom. Um... Oh, replacing Dino Land USA. That's a shame. Uh... Well, this is always really goofy. I've been here when I was a kid. I've known nothing. Is this a thing? That's a movie that came out? Maybe it's coming out? I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Um. Anyway. I don't understand what any of this has to do with animals. At least dinosaurs are animals. Why are they replacing that with something else? That's a shame. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know. Never trust a big company. Um, when they produce something lovely and beautiful, but it doesn't quite bring the profits that they were, uh, you know, lusting over. Then you know they'll you know they'll just bulldoze it. Um, anyway, Dino Land USA at Disney World in Florida. Um, actually holds a not super trivial place in the history of dinosaur paleontology. This is the place where some of Sue's bones um, Sue the Tyrannosaurus, now on display, reposited at the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. Um, some of Sue's fossils were actually prepared here in Orlando at Dino Land USA at, uh, at Disney World. And when the Field Museum purchased Sue, that was only possible because Disney Corporation and McDonald's Corporation basically paid for, for Sue, that $8 million. Can I find you a video about that? Um... Let's see here. Field Museum, you cannot miss this big lady that guards the door. It is Sue the T-Rex, and Chris Rose actually finds out a little bit more about her in today's Did You Know? Imagine you're a dinosaur walking through a prehistoric forest. You're going about your day to day when suddenly through the trees comes the greatest predator the world has ever known. It's the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And it sees you as its next <laughs> a little goofy. Terrifying yeah. to think about, right? But such was the life of Sue, the Field Museum's most famous resident. Wait, Sue had to be worried about being preyed upon by terror. That didn't quite follow, but whatever. In the summer of yeah. 1990, a group of workers from the Black Hill Institute were on an Black Hills Institute, in South Dakota. They were ah, uh, paleontological dig, paleontological dig, not archaeological. Oh boy. Yeah. Hunt for dinosaur fossils. Who wrote this segment? I know, right, Saggy Iguana? But no one among them expected to find a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton over 90% intact. The Why are they showing foot? Is that Lindsay Zano right there? I think this is Lindsay Zano from uh, the Museum of North Carolina. Find a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton over 90% intact. 
That's Lindsay Zano. What? They're just using like weird stock footage here. Not weird stock footage. It's weird that they're using this stock footage here. Lindsay Zano is, uh, like we were talking about yesterday, a rising, not rising star. Her star has risen and continues to rise. Lindsay Zano is a big shot in dinosaur paleontology nowadays. Um, when I was in, uh, in Utah this summer for that conference at the beginning of June, uh, Lindsay's team presented a bunch of different talks. Uh, Lindsay's a real mover and shaker in the field nowadays. We we sang the song Jolene on yesterday's stream. Jolene, please don't take my grant. Lindsay Zano is getting a lot of those grants. Holy cow. Yeah. Uh, you become Jolene. By having your stock footage used? I guess so, Ken. I guess so. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. Lindsay, she's doing uh, pretty incredible work. Yeah. So she's your rival? I. In the same way that maybe uh, a small gnat is rival to uh, an African lion? Um, I'm the gnat in this scenario. Lindsay Zano is a big shot, Patrick Crusader. Yeah. Tact. The discovery anyway. was by team member Sue Hendrickson, and it is in her honor that this monster from the past is named. Sue was a rare find indeed, because up until this point, most T-Rex fossils that were found were missing over half their skeletons. It's yeah. not Sue died by water and was quickly covered. Died by water. <laughs> Makes it sound like... Like she was allergic to water and she got rained on and then she died. Died near water would be a, a good way to put that. Died near water and then was buried. She was in a sandstone, I think, um, which implies a fluvial environment. Uh, was covered by, by you know, river sediments. I don't think... She was not a mudstone. Fine, she was, I think, mostly articulated. I think sandstone. Uh, animals that die in or, in or near lakes, lacustrine environments, usually it's like a mudstone environment. The skeleton has a tendency to, like, disarticulate, pieces fall apart. Um, but in, a, you know, a, a sandstone, especially like a channel sandstone, or other kinds of sandstones, fluvial sandstones, the skeleton tends to stay together. Yeah. I was literally thinking died by water as in drowned. Exactly, Ominous George. Again, who wrote this piece? Died near water. He should have said. Found. We're missing over half she was made of sugar. It's thought Sue died by water and was quickly covered by mud. <laughs> she was made of sugar. Kept Sue preserved. And she wasn't covered by mud. She was covered by sand, I think. Again. Oh, boy. Who wrote this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm melting. There you go, Grim Deviant. Yes. What's the chances of dying by meteor? Very slim, Freelancer. In fact, actually, I think impossible. I think the chances of dying by meteor are zero. I don't think you can die from a meteor. Because a meteor... Shoot. We're going to get into a whole thing now, aren't we? Whole rabbit hole here. Not quite a ring of fire, but maybe a ball of fire falling from the sky. Yeah. Here we go. Name that space rock. This is actually a really handy little little chart here. This is my understanding of how this works. So the difference between a comet, an asteroid, a meteor, meteoroid, a meteor, and a meteorite. So a comet is ice and rock originating from the outer solar system, often called ice and dust. A comet usually has a tail. It's a thing outside the atmosphere. An asteroid is a rock in orbit generally between Mars and Jupiter. Sometimes asteroids get bounced towards Earth. This is probably what hit the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous and killed the dinosaurs, except for birds. Uh, meteoroid is a space rock that's bigger than a dust grain, but smaller than an asteroid. If it strikes Earth, then it is a meteorite. A meteor, however, is the light phenomenon that is produced when a meteoroid goes through the atmosphere. So the streak of light 
that's seen when a space rock enters the atmosphere and starts burning up is called a meteor. So the meteor is just the streak of light. So to be killed by a meteor? Maybe you could be killed by a meteor if you're driving a car and you see a streak of light in the sky and then you're not paying attention and you drive off a cliff or into a volcano or something. Then maybe you died from a meteor. But it, you'd have to try really hard for that to happen, I guess. It's not very likely. But you could be killed by a meteoroid or a meteorite if it hits you, I suppose. But this is just a light phenomenon, you know? So, yeah. It could land on you. No, a, a light phenomenon can't really land on you. Again, the meteor is just the light. It's the thing that you see. It's the streak of light that you see in the sky. I guess you could be hit by a streak of light, but it's... It's not even going to give you a sunburn. It's so brief. You know? But an asteroid, a meteoroid, or a meteorite, those are physical objects. They can they can get you. Yeah. So if a meteor doesn't entirely burn up, a piece of space rock that lands on Earth is called a meteorite. There you go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyway. Like thunder and lightning. That's a good way to put it, Rosand. I'm still not 100% sure that that this is actually how it works. And I've spoken with astronomers before, and they're like, well, shoot, I don't know. These are loosey-goosey terms. But this is maybe the most cogent explanation I've ever seen of this. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. But surely if a meteor doesn't entirely burn up implies that it's a physical object which can burn up? That's see. That's what confuses me, Anonymous Jorts. And thank you, Birds Are Dead On, for that gift sub to Freelancer. I appreciate that, Birds. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. So, is it only called a meteor when it's traveling through the atmosphere, and then when it makes impact, it's called a meteorite? This would still imply that you can't be killed by a meteor, you're killed by the meteorite, because when it makes impact, that's when it becomes a meteorite? What about a meteor hitting a plane? I think it becomes a meteorite when it, well, it hasn't landed on Earth. That's a good question, Sis Edmund. I don't know, actually. I don't know. Shoot. I almost feel like... You know, this would actually make a pretty... I don't know how interesting it would be, but I would find it helpful if someone, maybe me, were to produce a video about this at some point and interview some astronomers, astrophysicists, try and get a consensus view on... The difference between these these terms, asteroid, meteoroid, meteor, meteorite, and a comet is a, its own thing. That's mostly ice. So yeah. Um, how did we get talking about this? Shoot. Let's get back to, to Sue, uh, the Tyrannosaurus kept her away from any scavengers that might have been looking for a free meal. Shortly after its discovery, the fossil became the center of an intense ownership dispute that resulted in a decision to sell Sue at public auction. In 1997, the Field Museum with yeah, that whole thing organizations is a mess. like McDonald's and Walt Disney... Yep, and there we go. That's why we're bringing this up. So the Field Museum got that $8 million from McDonald's and Walt Disney Corporation. So... McDonald's, uh, I think, actually wanted a McDonald's location inside the Field Museum, and so they got a multi-year lease or something. I th think that's the case. Somebody can fact-check me on that. I'm not entirely sure that's the case. We've got some uh, intrepid uh, truth seekers in the chat. Maybe somebody can figure that out. Was there ever a McDonald's in the Field Museum? What did McDonald's get out of the deal? But Walt Disney Corporation...
they got a full cast of Sue that is out on display in Disney World, Dino Land, USA. Yeah, the museum did not sell the dinosaur. No, TMK. Sue is there at the Field Museum. Walt Disney Corporation and McDonald's helped the museum buy the specimen at auction. And it was really a sad day for dinosaur paleontology, honestly. It was not a good thing. Because suddenly everybody saw dinosaurs as being big business, big money, you know? And that's been really harmful to dinosaur paleontology ever since. But anyway, uh, in return for giving the Field Museum a few million dollars to purchase the specimen for the museum, uh, Disney World got a cast of the specimen to put on display in their park. There it is there. You can still go see it to this day. Uh, I don't know what McDonald's got out of the deal. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and $8 million is a lot of money. Way too much money, Dr. Irrefutable. Way too much money. It's pretty crazy. Purchased Sue for $8.4 million. Yeah, here we go. She became the center of an intense ownership dispute that resulted oh in the decision to sell Sue at public auction. In 1997, the Field Museum, with help from organizations like McDonald's and Walt Disney, purchased Sue yep. for $8.4 million. Yeah, this is the largest outside. amount of money on this. ever paid for a fossil. New research facilities oh, were shoot, built not in anymore, it's not. specifically oh, for boy. Sue, and workers logged thousands of hours preparing her bones for display. And in the year 2000, Sue made her debut. Since Sue's debut here at the Field Museum, scientists have been studying her rigorously. They found a lot of cool things, and one of the main... And this is old. Yeah, I did a, a live stream from here at the Field Museum. Uh, not this past summer, but the summer before. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of you were actually here for that, for my, uh, my live stream, mobile live stream from the Field Museum. But we went to go see Sue, and that was, that was pretty neat. It was pretty neat. Um, but she's got her own hall upstairs now. She's no longer on display over here. That's where the, uh, the Patago Titan skeleton is. Big Titanosaur. The things they found was yeah. that they could tell her age by the rings in her bones, much the way you would tell the Histology. age of a tree. They found out that Sue was 28 years old when she died. Now, I know that doesn't seem very old, but by T-Rex standards, that meant Sue had her AARP card. Sue stands at 12 feet high and 42 feet long and weighs over 4,000 pounds. In fact, her head was so large and weighed so much that the museum had to make a lighter cast of the skull to go on display. Yep, but that's true. Worry, the real skull is close by. So not only is the was the real skull too heavy, it's also squashed. So as this fossil was there in the ground for 68 million years, it got smushed just by the weight of the overlying rock. Uh, you know, we call this diagenetic deformation. It's really common in dinosaur fossils. Oftentimes you see them get squashed. And uh, so they, I guess they scanned Sue's skull and then they kind of undeformed it in the computer and they were able to kind of do an early rapid prototyping thing, almost like an early 3D printing kind of a dealie. Uh, in order to uh, to produce a lightweight, unsquished skull to put on the end of her neck. Um, speaking of 3D prints, let me check on this. I'm going to go look at this with my own eyeballs real quick, make sure it's going well. I'll be right back. Yeah, 
Yeah, there are a bunch of pieces that were curled up right there. That was that print was going to fail, and I didn't want to waste any more filament, so I had to restart that. So we're starting it over. Cross your fingers that it works this time around. I probably need to change up that nozzle. I think the nozzle is pr probably worn out after printing this whole thing and a bunch of other prints. You know, a full-size Allosaurus skull will do that. You know? That's, uh... That's a pretty sizable element right there. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, back to Sue here. Bye for further inspection. Since Sue debuted here at the Field Museum, she's greeted... And Gimpleg, welcome back. Oh, Gimpleg, we're going to talk about Ineosaurus in a little bit now that you're here. Welcome back, Gimpleg. Thank you for redeeming that dinosaur deep dive yesterday. We'll get to it today. For further inspection. Since Sue debuted here at the Field Museum, she's greeted millions of visitors from all over the world. So the next time you're here, you got to check her out. And frankly, you can't really miss her. Did you know? That is so Some of that awesome. I did not know. Right? I remember so awesome. when she made her debut, though. Yeah, I, well, and something I think people have either yeah. forgotten about or didn't know was Sue wasn't going to be named Sue. Sue was going to be named Dakota, huh? believe it or not. Oh, after the state. Well, yeah, oh, where, yeah. where she was found. But uh, the Black Hills Institute, they held the naming rights, and they didn't want the Field Museum using it. So the oh. Field Museum had a contest with Chicago schools, and they asked I, I kids to write that. Right? Yeah. I do remember that. And then so all these. I don't think that's true. I really don't think that's true. At least Sue was called Sue way back in the early 1990s. All of the protest signs and everything from that time. Uh, they had the name Sue on them. I'm not finding it here in Google Images, but let me grab a book. Published 1994. That's three years before the auction. There we go. Um, oh yeah, there's our, uh, our Overapterosaur there, who's currently printing. Um, there we go. Photographic evidence. From 1992. Two, I think? There we go. Yeah. Save Sue, we love Sue, etc., etc. They were calling her Sue way back before any naming contest in Chicago in the late 90s. That's... That part's... Ex don't think that's true. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, and Broken Link. Oh shoot, Truckhorn. Well, that sounds interesting. Go ahead and post that again if you can figure out how to how to get the link right. Yeah. So Sue was named after Susan Hendrickson, who found the skeleton. Exactly. Gamers Tavern show. Yes. Yes. Um. Anyway, so this where where she was found, but didn't know was Sue wasn't going to be named Sue. Sue was going to be named Dakota, believe it or not. I've never heard this before. Well, yeah, where, where she was found, but uh, the Black Hills Institute, they held the naming rights, and they didn't want the Field Museum using it. So the Field Museum had a contest with Chicago school. I think he has this exactly backwards, actually. I think that the the Black Hills Institute probably didn't want them using the name Sue, because Sue was what they'd been calling the, the Tyrannosaur since it was excavated. It's named after Susan Hendrickson, who, who discovered it. I think that the... I bet you that 
that they held a naming contest in Chicago and the kids came up with the name Dakota and then it just didn't stick. I think that's probably what happened. I think this guy's got it exactly backwards. And they asked kids to write that. That. Yeah. I do remember that. And then so all these kids wrote in, Dakota was the name that was chosen. And uh, what ended up happening was the Black Hills Institute, right before Sue debuted, the Black Hills Institute said, you know what, the dinosaur's name is Sue. Uh, so, and, and that is the name. And it's appropriate. But, but we don't know if... Oh, okay. We're kind of talking past one another. He just kind of misspoke at the beginning, it sounds like. Okay. Okay. Good. We're all on the same page. Yeah. Sue really is technically a boy or a girl, right? We, we don't. Do we, uh, yeah, we but don't But that know. gives a, a whole new meaning to the song The Boy Named Sue, right. which was written by Shel Silverstein, who is a Chicagoan. <laughs> right. It all ties in together. It does. Wait, such... I didn't know Shel Silverstein was oh a Chicagoan. Oh, my God. Well, and yes. worked for Playboy. I didn't know Wait, the, the Johnny Cash song? Yeah. I did years. not know that. I love him. And I told yeah, the Field I Museum, it. I said, if you go back through your donor registry, I bet you in the 50s and 60s, yeah. Hugh Hefner probably gave money someplace, so it'll come totally full circle. This is money wow. so well spent. Yes. It is. So okay. incredibly well spent. And there were uh, uh, money well spent. I mean, yes and no. With $8 million, you could establish a whole new museum and find a dozen Tyrannosaurus specimens. It's honestly not money well spent, if you ask me. Um, and shoot. I was on the news. talking about this almost a year ago. Check it out. Talking about the commercial dinosaur trade. Hey. Welcome back. In the world of dinosaur bones, something is out of joint. A skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex named Shem was due to be auctioned with appropriate hype in Hong Kong this coming week. Expected to fetch more than 20 million pounds, Shen was abruptly withdrawn from sale by uh, auction house Christie's when doubts emerged over the provenance of parts of the skeleton. The plot thickens as it appears that some of Shen may be replicated from the bones of another T-Rex called Stan. Not some, most, most of the Shen specimen is just casts of Stan's bones. Stan's bones. It really kind of irks me that a lot of these fossil specimens get nicknames like this, and it's just... I don't know. It's a way to try and raise the the market price on these things for the people who want to sell them. You know? But yeah. This Jurassic whodunit has... Lenina's right about this, yeah. Millions yeah. are made illegally trading bones and fossils, which are diverted from scientists who could study them. Uh, David Waterhouse is the senior curator of natural history and geology at Norfolk Museum. And so again, a respected scientist right here, a well-known broadcaster in the center. And I don't know who that dig dingus is on the, on the far end there, but yeah. This is from Norwich. Hello. Good to speak to you again. Yeah, and, nice to see you, Michael. And from Northern California, dino dinosaur paleontologist Danny Anduza, who hosts Paleontologizing which can be viewed on Twitch. On what? What's this guy talking about? Twitch? What's that? I ain't never heard of that. Huh? Um, so, uh, David, first of all, uh, why does it matter that there's an illegal trade? In what way are they diverted from scientists, and why does that matter? Yeah, I think... Um... You know, the, these are really important things. They're not. They're not just um, uh, art. And I think that's the. That, uh... Uh, so, David, this is David Waterhouse here, who's a British paleontologist. Um, yeah, I actually talked with him after the the interview on here via Twitter, and we had to bring him on for an interview at some point. Um, yeah, he seems like a seems like a cool guy. Maybe slightly unfortunate. Um, placement of some of his decor there but um yeah that's the problem that's not to 
downgrade art in any way. Um, but we're picking up scientific information about our environment, the environment in the past. We can learn about our environment in the future. Um, so potentially really important science can, can be lost um, if, if these fossils like T-Rexes and, and other fossils go straight into the hands of, of private uh, individuals. True. Um, Danny, I agree. do you understand why a skeleton could be worth $20 million or pounds or whatever? Oh, boy. I, keep in mind, I, I didn't do as well in this interview as I would have liked to have done, but it was like 2 in the morning here, as I recall, because this was live. And, um, anyway, I had been up for almost 24 hours at that point. Shoot. But, yeah. Uh, frankly, Michael, I can't. Um, as somebody who's dug up a lot of dinosaurs over the years, um, I've done a lot of field work in places like Montana and Utah, working with various museums. It doesn't cost very much to dig these things up in the first place. Maybe a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to dig yeah. up. You know, a handful of bones, like uh, in the Shen specimen. It is just a handful of bones. The rest of it was filled in with uh, casts of the Stan skeleton. I should have made that more explicit, but I didn't. Yeah. There's really no reason in the world why it should sell for anything over a million dollars. Paleontologists like me are flabbergasted every time that happens, and I think it's because the buyers are being misled, as they were in the case of Shen. Um, sticking with you, Danny, there was the case of the uh, actor mm -hmm. Nicolas Cage, who um, he, right. he, into his possession there came a, a skull. Do you want to describe that and tell us what happened about that? Sure. There's so many of these cases that it's sort of difficult to, uh, to keep them separate sometimes. Pepper Cat says, you think with that big price tag, paleontologists are being all paid big salaries? Some of us aren't being paid salaries at all. <laughs> Some of us have to, you know, do a, a daily live stream in order to put, to pay the bills and put food on our plates, you know? Um, yeah, shoot. <laughs> As a paleontologist, I have never been paid for field work or museum work or anything like that. I've never been paid more than $10 an hour. Um... And this is while I was in the field in Montana. And, uh, yeah, I'd be working 12 or 14 hours a day, usually. Only getting paid for eight of those hours every day. Only getting paid for five days a week when we're working well, seven days a week. Yeah. So, you know, it comes out to less than minimum wage. Certainly. But, uh, Dr. Irrefutable, thank you for those 300 bits. I appreciate that very much. I really do. Thank you, thank you. And Double Tribble, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. Yeah. The P in paleontology stands for poverty. I mean, that's kind of true for science in general, or academia in general. If you're the sort of person who, you know, is, is working to try and advance the frontiers of human knowledge, if you're trying to expand the understanding of humankind, then people go, oh, well, you know, well, you're doing something that you feel passionate about? You shouldn't get paid for that. <laughs> it, it's really kind of shocking um, how little people are paid who are, uh, you know, making discoveries that advance our civilization. Um, you really want to make money? Uh, be a weapons dealer or, uh, you know, a, a C-suite executive or something like that, you know, a banker or, uh, a stockbroker, you know, be one of the people who's pulling society down. Within minutes, they were finding fossils. Thank you. Uh, Dark Mock Rises. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Sorry, you came in at a weird time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, anyway, be an entertainer. Well, even most entertainers are, what, street performers? Buskers on the subway platform? Um, to be somebody like Nicolas Cage, you know, that's, 
That's like the point oh 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 one percent, you know? Yeah. No, don't be a teacher. Teachers don't get paid anything, at least here in this country. Trek nerd, yeah. Ugh. Anyway. Yeah. And not scraping for a basic living through NSF grants? Most of us will never come within 100 miles of an NSF grant. El Hua, I don't think you can even apply for an NSF grant unless you're like a tenured professor at an institution. I don't, I don't think I can even apply for an NSF grant. A National Science Foundation grant? I don't think it's possible. So yeah, yeah. And actors are currently on strike because they're not getting paid. This is true, Gamers Tavern, and good on them. Solidarity. They should get what they're worth. Agreed. Sure. Yeah, and be Francis Ford Coppola's nephew and be Nick Cage. There you go, Chuckhorn. There you go. Yeah. There's so many of these cases that it's sort of difficult to uh, to keep. Thank you, Lenina. But Here. if I recall correctly, remind me again in a few minutes. This was a uh, a Tarbosaurus skull that Nicholas Cage, uh, I guess, purchased at auction, and that had been illegally smuggled out of Mongolia. Yep. Uh, you know, this country kind of nestled between uh, China and Russia. Uh, and I can't believe I thought it was necessary to explain to people the concept of mo the nation of Mongolia. This is what happens when you're interviewed at 2 in the morning or whatever it was, you know? Yeah. A wealth of dinosaur fossils from that country. One of the, the world's greatest, you know, dinosaur fossil fields. Recently, the people of Mongolia have been trying to kind of take hold of their heritage and make sure that fossils from their country are not being illegally exported and and sold. That had happened in the case of Nicolas Cage's uh, purchase. And I believe it was it was uh, seized by Interpol and actually taken back to the country of Mongolia. Uh, and apparently it wasn't Interpol. It was, I think it was uh, the U.S. State Department um, after complaints by the Mongolian government. I don't think it was Interpol at all. I got that wrong where it rightfully belongs so yeah i think it's a perfect example of kind of how shady these deals often are and if you're trying to buy dinosaur fossils interpol isn't a police force there you go caravan yeah there's a lot of uh, kind of difficult things going on in terms of morality and in terms of law these are not smart purchases to make um david uh, moving away from this i think rather hideous illegal trade Tell us about the proper use of dinosaur bones. Tell me about your passion. When, when you're given a skeleton, you're given a bone, how do you react mm -hmm. to it and what do you do with it? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I've been on, on T-Rex digs in, in Montana, which is where both Stan and, and um, uh, Shen originally came from. Yeah, uh, so he'd actually, David Waterhouse had worked with the Los Angeles County Museum back in the 90s or early 2000s, I think, when they were digging up some Tyrannosaurus specimens in Garfield County, Montana, a place where I've done a lot of work. Yeah. David Waterhouse, I didn't realize that. I thought, here's a paleontologist from the UK. He's probably never worked on any dinosaurs. There's not very many dinosaurs in the UK. But no, he has. He's been to Montana. He's dug up T-Rex before. Um, and, you know, it's that discovery. Um, I was working for a public institution, so now... But uh, this this T Rex is on display actually in Los Angeles, um, and it's that kind of feeling that you're the first person to to look at this ever <laughs> because there weren't people around when when dinosaurs were around, of course. Um, but uncovering something that's you know sixty six, sixty seven million years old, um, and finding out all that information and actually. <laughs> One of the problems with uh, treating skeletons like a sculpture and having it in your foyer uh, um, uh, 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 of a private company or, or a private house is that it is just a skeleton. If things are excavated properly, you're looking at the whole environment. There's the context there. Bits of information yeah. from the sediment around, um, you know, what the environment was like, what other animals were around, and and it's just so much more than just a skeleton. Um, it's that that whole whole entire picture. This is a really really important point that he makes here, and I want to emphasize this for everybody watching right now on this live stream. Yeah, you know, something like this. You know, this is, this is beautiful. This is a thing of beauty right here, this Allosaurus skull. It really is a beautimous object. But 
it's so much more than that. When you actually dig up a real Allosaurus skull in the field, there's a tremendous amount of scientific information in that. Not just in the object itself, not just in its morphology, but internally. You can maybe cut it open. You can do histology. You can figure out how old the animal was when it died. You can figure out its metabolism. Figure out, you know, how it would have lived based on the interior of its bones. You could figure out how it fits into the grand history of life on Earth by looking at those surrounding rocks, mapping out exactly where it comes from in the rock layer, looking for pollen grains associated with it, looking for zircons, looking for all of these contextual things around it. Honestly, the data around a fossil are often more important than the actual fossil itself, scientifically. If you're just looking at something like this, say say you're a, some sort of highfalutin wealthy person, you know? By hook or by crook, you've managed to uh, hoard millions, maybe billions of dollars for yourself. And, uh, and now you're looking to spend it on extravagant things. You decide a dinosaur fossil is something that, uh, you know, yes, that's something that'll stroke my ego. And so you purchase something like this. And you treat it as an art object. You just put it on the shelf. Well, shoot, scientists can't study it. It's not in a museum. It will not be preserved for future generations, most likely. Maybe it'll get lost in a divorce. You know, maybe it'll fall off the shelf and break because it's not under controlled museum conditions, whatever. Um, but also, chances are it wasn't dug up under responsible protocols. Those data that are maybe more important than the fossil itself were not collected in the field. So you're taking something that could add to the sum total of human knowledge and you're hoarding it for yourself. You're keeping it there on your shelf after paying an exorbitant fee for it, keeping it out of the hands of scientists and out of view of the public. And not having that specimen and the associated data available for scientific study. But there's an alternative to this kind of thing. And like I have here, shoot, this is a 3D print. This is not the actual specimen. This is perfectly wonderful to have in a private collection, you know, like my office right here. Because I'm not keeping this out of the hands of other scientists. It's made of plastic. It's 3D printed, you know? Uh, oh boy, that's not looking good on the printer. This print might fail too. Shoot. Anyway, there was a thing a while ago with, uh, with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who is, despite his name, not a geologist, but a movie star. Yeah. Here we go. Million dollars for this historic T Rex skeleton? The mystery was. So, yeah, this Tyrannosaurus specimen, also like Sue, was dug up by the Black Hills Institute in South Dakota and was auctioned off for many millions of dollars. Honestly, BHI has a really, really bad record with this kind of thing. They're, they're dinosaurs they claim are dug up for scientific purposes and then they just keep getting auctioned off. It's not a good look. It's. Well, forget optics. Who cares about optics? It's not good for science. Anyway. Yeah. Million dollars for this historic T-Rex skeleton? The mystery was sparked when Dwayne The Rock Johnson was being interviewed by Eli Manning. And the former Who? NFL quarterback noticed something intriguing in the background. Ah. Uh, so anybody could have told you if you know anything about Dinosaur fossils. That's a cast right there. That's not the real thing. Um, but 
you know, this is a cast. Maybe he also bought the real one, and maybe he got a cast of the skull as a nice little, like, little bonus that they threw in. Uh, this was a concern for a while. You got a T-Rex behind you? What is that? A <laughs> I, do. I got a, I got a T-Rex skull. Yes, it's, it's, that's Stan. As a matter of fact, so Stan was the, uh, is the most complete T-Rex skull ever found uh, by a paleontologist, a young paleontologist, and his name was Stan. So this T-Rex head was named. Is Stan Sackerson a paleontologist? It's name. Anyway, who cares? Whatever. Yup, The Rock's home office features a T-Rex, just like the fearsome creature in Jurassic Park. Instantly, dinosaur mavens began to wonder if The Rock's beast is actually a 67 million year old... And that's the Wonkle Rex right there. Where is she right now? Shoot. That's the Wonkle Rex right there. We were talking about the Wonkle Rex earlier in September. And I had a I had a whole map of different uh, places where uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, edit the map. Saved recent. They moved all this stuff around recently, and it's pretty aggravating because I can't find my maps here. My data in maps? That's not it. My maps. You got to Google it now. There we go. Wonkle Rex locations. So we did a whole stream about this particular Tyrannosaurus specimen which was dug up here the discovery site in uh, near Fort Peck Lake in Montana and oh boy hang on 3 print this is not going well i got to i got to abort this print Sorry about that, everybody, but uh, I don't want to waste any more filament on this. I'm going to have to troubleshoot this thing and figure it out later. Um, but yeah, yeah. How can I tell the print isn't going well? Because the nozzle was snagging against the filament that's already there. The filament was curling up on the print bed, and the, the nozzle was snagging against that and tearing it off. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we did a when we were talking about the Wonkle Rex, we did a, we did a whole stream about this particular Tyrannosaurus specimen, which you see right here. But I'm not sure which museum this is, or I would have added this to our map here. I've got all of these plus one in the UK. And one in Japan right there. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, and tactile 3D picture. It's not air movements. It's definitely not that. Um, I think I've been using this novel for about... 2,000 hours of printing time, it's probably time for me to replace the nozzle, honestly. That's probably part of it. Yeah. And there is one in Dallas. There you go. Uh, at the Perot Museum. Yeah. 
Yeah. The Tyrannosaurus specimen at the Perot Museum is the Wonkle Rex. Displacer, you should go check it out. Seriously, go check out that museum. It's a really impressive one, the Perot Museum. Yeah. Um, anyway, really, really cool. But, I don't know which museum this is right here, but they have a cast. That's that same Tyrannosaurus skeleton, the, skeleton, the or skull, the Wonkle Rex right there. They have a cast of it. T-Rex that was sold at auction in 2020. It was named Stan after the paleontologist who discovered him in South Dakota. The auction house Christie's has never identified the anonymous bidder who paid all those millions for Stan in 2020. Ugh. So, was it The Rock? Or is his home office T-Rex just a replica? Replicas of T-Rex skulls are not uncommon. You can see this one yep. here at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. Jersey City, New Jersey? There we go. Let's add that to our map right here. There we go. Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. Add to map. There we go. There's another... Oh, my scroll wheel is being finicky right now. But there we go. There is yet another example of the Wonkle Rex. There are casts of this dinosaur all over the world. And we just added another one. Very nice. Yeah. Update the map. I just did, HD. Yeah. Good stuff. By the way, the original is in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, on permanent loan from Museum of the Rockies. Right there. Uh, at the National Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian. N-M-N-H. Anyway, you... If you're curious about this... Then uh, I did a whole stream about it. And let me find that for you here. I think it should be up on YouTube already, right? Yeah. Um... Oh, shoot. Maybe it's not. Never mind. I thought it was up there, but... Maybe it's not yet. Darn it. Um. Maybe you can find it in the VODs? It should still be up there. Past broadcast is what I'm searching for here. Too many things to click. There we go. This one is not up on YouTube yet, I guess. But uh, I should download it and put it up there. But yeah, talking all about the Wonkle Rex. And uh, why this is important. There's a link to that, uh, that VOD right there for you. Yeah. And David Trash says, is the T-Rex in the Natural History Museum in New York real? It is. Yeah, that's AMNH 5027 is the specimen number. You didn't find a video about it. There we go. This is the king of time. For many of us, Tyrannosaurus Rex is the dinosaur, our lens into a lost world. Since its discovery, the word Tyrannosaurus has been used in print more than twice as many times as any other dinosaur name. <laughs> T-Rex landed its first starring role the same year as Rudolph Valentino. 
I don't know who that is. I don't know who Rudolfo Valentino is, but I know who Tyrannosaurus is. So yeah, yeah. The same year as Rudolph Valentino. Ever since a fossil hunter from the American Museum of Natural History. Barnum Brown. Rex out of the uh, a man whose uh, whose footsteps we were retracing this past summer. Uh, we were digging in some of the same rocks that Barnum Brown was digging in this past summer. Me and Ethan and Fisher and and uh, and and Ken and the rest of the crew. Yeah. Montana dirt. It's ruled our view of the past. Icons tend to capture the public imagination. There's Michael Novacek again. Big and too, sometimes too ugly and sometimes too beautiful to be denied. We didn't excavate the bucket, My Thalo. Work, I, get I think it's still there. read the manuscript first. So and David Trash says, so why is this one so special? Because it's in New York City and it's seen by millions and millions of people. Um, it's one of the two original Tyrannosaurus specimens to be put on public display. Uh, the original Tyrannosaurus specimen was also at AM and H, but then AM and H, the American Museum of Natural History, um, they sold it to uh, to the museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, during World War II because they were afraid that the Germans would bomb New York and uh, and the only two T Rex skeletons that had been dug up in the whole world would be destroyed. So they sold one of them to Pittsburgh as kind of an insurance policy, you know, just to be safe. New York wasn't bombed, um, but Pittsburgh's had that one ever since. Anyway, this is the most famous Tyrannosaurus specimen in the world, at least in the sense that it became the, uh, the inspiration for the Jurassic Park logo. Yeah. Um... Yeah. And Assault Rabbit says, why were they so big compared to animals alive today? I mean, they were and they weren't, Assault Rabbit. Yeah. Shoot, we'll, we'll continue this video in a minute, but not all dinosaurs were huge. Many dinosaurs were small. Um, Take them away downtown, walking fast, faces packing and homebound. Thank you, Patrick Crusader, for the four months. Of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick Crusader. There's Microraptor. Its name implies that it's small, and it was small. A lot of dinosaurs were small like this. Um, the thing is, we used to have really big animals running around, you know, not dinosaurs, but Ice Age mammals. Up until just a few thousand years ago, so... Geologically speaking, until like last Thursday, these animals were running around. Almost every single one of these animals was wiped out, at least in part, due to humans. So yeah, giant sloths, like David Trash said, giant mammoths, elephant birds, giant camels, giant horses, mastodons, Giant gorillas, uh, woolly rhinoceros, short-faced bears, saber-toothed cats, etc. These critters lived alongside humans, and many, if not most, if not all of them, went extinct because of humans. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. None of these are dinosaurs, by the way, except for the elephant bird which is a bird, and birds are dinosaurs. Rodents of unusual size? Those two. Grilled Pikachu, there was. A rodent of unusual size called Amblariza. I don't know how to spell it, but I'm going to try. Amblariza? That's not it. Amblariza? No. Amblariza? Nope. Amblariza? Ambriza? No, shoot. 
Darn it, what was it? Paleo World Giant Rats. Here we go. On a tiny island in the Caribbean, there once lived a rat twice the size of a man. Yeah. Its very existence is a nightmare. No, it's not. It's basically a big capybara. The answer is guarded by a death trap. Capybaras are a cute. A murky chasm that leads into the unknown depths and unmapped past of the island of giant rats. Yeah. Anyway, Paleo World. This song used to... Well, still. It fills my heart with... With pride. I used to watch this when I was a kid. This was my favorite show. Holy cow, when I could catch this on TV, I was over the moon. And I used to listen to this theme song and say, you know what? Someday I'm going to be a paleontologist. I'm going to dig up fossils. I'm going to study them. I'm going to gonna talk about them with the general public. And, and here we are today. Beautiful. Yeah. Dead for the last time. There you go, Brian. <laughs> One of the tiniest jewels yeah. in the Caribbean Sea is Anguilla. Ah. Called the rock. It's a lump of limestone covering Anguilla. 34 that means the eel, miles. doesn't it? Anguilla? It's Anguilla? Long, thin shape accounts for its name. It's an eel, right? Anguilla is Spanish for eel. But perhaps the island is named for the wrong creature. Embler mm. Riza, thank you, Lenina and Truckhorn. Yes. The king of Anguilla's jungle was a rat as big as a bear. <laughs> Fascinated yeah. by this prehistoric mystery, three fossil hunters set out to find the giant rodent called Amblariza. And of course, the closed captions don't get it right, but Truckhorn did. Amblariza. I almost got it. Ugh. There we go. A gigantic rodent. A rodent of unusual size, you might say. There we go. Yeah. Um, pretty cool critter. Has it been renamed since then? I'm not seeing Wikipedia on here. Um, here. Let's see what we get. The blunt tooth giant Hushia. Hutia. Ambleriza inundata. I guess that is still its genus name. It's an extinct species of giant hutia. What what are hutias? Twice as large as the capybara. Oh, but Josepho Artigasia monesi. I believe someone, some clever chatter, already posted this into the chat, didn't they? Check this out. This critter lived in the early Pliocene to the early Pleistocene of Uruguay. And there's a modern relative, the Pacarana. Grinding teeth, incisors, skull, body mass. Paleoecology. early Pleistocene, this critter may have gone extinct before the introduction of humans to South America. Huh. Yeah. Anyway. There were big old rats. Not rats, but rodents that lived back then. Like this critter, Amblariza. So, the point stands... Um, I 
Yeah, shoot. It's not that creatures were necessarily super large during the time of the dinosaurs. It's just that in our modern age, most of the super large creatures have been killed by humans. Not dinosaurs, obviously. Dinosaurs, except for birds, were wiped out by an asteroid 66 million years ago. But all of these wonderful large beasties... It's a funny thing. They seem to disappear shortly after humans appear in their environments. So we killed the big land animals. Yeah, ominous torts. And it might not have been through direct hunting, but maybe just ecosystem collapse. You hunt a few species, you build a bunch of fires, the fires spread through the landscapes, they burn the plants that, uh, that some of these creatures rely on, and the ecosystem kind of collapses. And the... The long-term effect is that the bigger creatures are the ones that suffer because they require more food, they need larger habitats, there are fewer of them in an ecosystem, and there are smaller creatures, they're more vulnerable to extinction. So yeah. So all of these beautiful, wonderful critters here... all go extinct around the same time that uh, that us humans show up in their ecosystems. It's, it's a real shame. Yeah. And Thagamizmer, thanks for being here. You, uh, you get some good rest. And Assault Rabbit says, well explained. Thank you. You're welcome, Assault Rabbit. Thank you for the good, the good question. Critters get big. If they're allowed to. Anyway. None of those creatures that you saw there, by the way, get as big as the biggest dinosaurs. The biggest dinosaurs are so much larger. But dinosaurs are pretty special in that regard. Uh, there. You know, dinosaurs were gargantuan. The biggest of the sauropod dinosaurs? Forget about it. They were huge. Just absolutely enormous. Aerospace News, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Sounds like you're in the right place. Welcome, welcome to the channel. Good to have you here. Let me know if you got any questions. Fellow science person. Good to have you here. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Sauropod dinosaurs got really, really big. But also, Tyrannosaurus was pretty big, too. Let's talk about... Him slash her the slash them. They're just too big and too sometimes too ugly and sometimes too beautiful to be denied. Yeah. And stem street stem comes are my cup of nice to find you and thanks for the welcome. Great to have you, Aerospace News. Holy cow! Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I dig up dinosaurs. I did that live on stream back during the summer, during the field season. And now uh, back in my office, talking fossils with everybody here. We're on a wild goose chase of different tangents and different questions that we're answering and all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah, we're talking about the Tyrannosaurus specimen in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History right now. So, yeah, let me know if you got any questions. Aerospace News. Yeah. In my work, I get to read the manuscript first. So I read the manuscript of Jurassic Park. Oh, this We're is talking, that. This, would have been this is that graphic designer who designed the logo for Jurassic Park. Back in 1989, I was relatively young, 25, 26, junior designer for book jackets at Alfred A. Knopf. Chip Kidd is the man behind a famous really dinosaur. Really spared no expense. And Lenina. gifted a tier one sub to Aerospace News. Lenina, thank you, thank you. And fifty two gift subs in the channel. Thank you for gifting Aerospace News. I appreciate that, Lenina. Aerospace News, you don't have to worry about ads for the next thirty days, thanks to Lenina there. And you'll also get all those cool emotes like these and these, and these and these and these. 
And these. Excellent. Anyway, good to have you here. How have I never heard of your channel? You're partnered, Aerospace News, and I've, I'm not familiar with your channel? Gonna have to check you out. In fact, I'm gonna have to follow you right now. Let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. Good stuff. Um. Anyway, back to our video here. Some of you will remember this guy. We watched a, a TED talk or TED X talk with him the other day. He designed the Jurassic Park logo. You know, you know the one. This one right here. This one. This one. Which we were joking about this last week. Um, this animal doesn't have a nose. The Neris is missing. Like on our Allosaurus skull right here, there's the nostril. There's the, the bony nostril, the Neris, right there. What the animal smells and breathes with. And this... It's like that old joke, you know? Yeah. My Tyrannosaurus has got no nose. Well, how does he smell? Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And Linnea says, I can't not see that it doesn't have a nose now. There you go, Lenina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Empilave Lorenzini, like a shark has? Yeah, dinosaurs didn't have that. The, um... No. Cooking fat. Nothing like that. Yeah. Anyway, and you're a nobody? I'm sure that's not true, Aerospace News. Everybody's a somebody. And I appreciate your follow. Welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Let's, uh... Let's continue here. So this guy designed that logo and uh, forgot the nostril. Behind him is the dinosaur that inspired his famous book cover. Yeah, Mitch was missing its creating nose. Creating a design for Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, Chip searched for ideas. Hmm. Certainly there's a lot of books on dinosaurs, scientific paleontology, and fantasy. So there's some decent books right there. Um, it's a lot of books on dinosaurs. Science I wonder if this is in the Amon H Library. Dinosauria, Dinosaur Lives, right there by uh, by Jack Horner. Yeah, Dinosaurs Without Bones by Tony Martin. Good book, good book. With any luck, we'll be interviewing Tony Martin on our stream here in a few weeks. Let's see. Uh, I need to send him another email. I don't know if he checks his. Tony Martin author email very often. I need to find his business card again and just send him an email at his proper address. Um, anyway, yeah. Ecology and fan. Uh, dinosaur falls of Korea. Dinosaur tracks. Uh, Weird dinosaurs by John Pickrell, who used to write for National Geographic. Good, good writer. Uh, Martin Lockley, Dinosaur Tracks, good stuff. These are good books. In between. So, the problem to solve when... It's not my bookshelf, no. First Arguably, I've got more dinosaur books than they've got. But yeah. ...book jacket for Jurassic Park was to somehow entice the reader into a story that was about dinosaurs, but like nothing that they had ever encountered before. Mm. And Martin Lockley, Brennington. Yes, Martin Lockley. And there's Martin Lockley right there. He's an ichnologist. Here he is with David Attenborough, I think, back in the day. Yeah. Um, he studies dinosaur tracks, and uh, he was at the same conference that I was at back in June, and I spoke with him for a while. Good guy, Martin Lockley. Yeah, here, 
really quick snippet. Martin Lockley. Um, dinosaur tracks uh, contribute to extinction is very, very interesting. Um, t 15, 20 years ago, um, there was uh, quite a lot of debate amongst people who studied the bones saying that um, actually dinosaurs may have been dying out before the, the final meteorite impact or extinction event. Huh. And the reason for this was it's not always easy to find bones at every little level up to this uh, boundary. But um, if you find tracks, which we, which we did, right uh, uh, up just immediately below the boundary, you know that you have uh, living animals. So there was this concept of a three-meter gap. Uh, yeah, the, the three-meter gap, three-meter gap. Impact layer. And we reduced that to about 30 centimeters by finding, <laughs> finding dinosaur tracks right up to that level, yep. which kind of uh, confirms that animals were living until the, the very last minute. Yep, really cool stuff. Martin Lockley, you can do important stuff with dinosaur tracks. And he has, and he continues to do so. Good stuff. Yeah. Anyway. In the context of like calculating gate, no, showing that dinosaurs were still alive right before the asteroid impact. There's this idea that maybe dinosaurs, like, oh yeah, they were already in steep decline before the asteroid ever hit. They were already extinct before the asteroid hit. No, Martin Lockley helped show they're still around, they're still doing just fine. It was still business as, as usual until that asteroid hit. Dinosaurs, if it hadn't been for that asteroid, they would still be around today. You know? In a form other than just birds. Birds survived. So, s s strictly speaking, dinosaurs never went extinct. We still have birds today. But the dinosaurs other than birds would have survived if it hadn't been for that asteroid. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. An Aerospace News says, Love it as a book title, but are there any normal dinosaurs not weird? As contrasted with us? What is a normal dinosaur? I don't know. Maybe something like a, um... A Hypsilophodontian dinosaur? Are these guys pretty normal? They're pretty normal, I guess. I don't know. If there's a most normal dinosaur, maybe it's a Hypsilophodontian. Hypsilophodontian. Which, it turns out, they're not actually a distinct group of dinosaurs. It's like, there's different groups of dinosaurs that evolve this same body plan. But anyway, yeah. And you spelled Geranosaurus wrong, Caravan. I know you're making a joke, Genirosaurus, but Geranosaurus looks a lot like this. I mean, it's... It's funny that you said that, but, um, yeah, Geranosaurus may or may not be the same dinosaur as, uh, hips, as, uh, Heterodontosaurus, I think. Geranosaurus, right? Yeah. From the early Jurassic. It's considered a nomen dubium. It's classified as an ornithischian based on the jaw, probably a Heterodontosaurid. It's probably the same critter as Heterodontosaurus whom I visited earlier this week. Good old Heterodontosaurus. Right there. Yeah. A little beaky plant-eating dinosaur. Yeah. Where am I going? It's over here. I 3D printed a skull of this critter last week. And here it is. There you go. Heterodontosaurus, which in itself is almost kind of a weird dinosaur in that it's got these tusks right there. These canine teeth. Most dinosaurs do not have fangs. But this is a dinosaur that does, and it's a plant-eating dinosaur that does, which 
Maybe that is weird, you know? And this is to scale. Yep, this is actual size right there. Ought to do it. Hippo-esque? I mean... It probably wasn't aquatic like a hippo. Even semi-aquatic. But yeah. Yeah. It's a cool critter. It is a cool critter. It's only small because its body isn't there. I mean, that's how big the body is. This is an animal that's like a meter long. You know? So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm excited to uh, to get this thing sanded and smoothed and uh, and painted. But it'll be a little while till that happens, I think. Because I've got so many other things going on this month. Yeah. Could we keep one as a pet? Asked Brian the primate. You probably could. I mean, that might be a little bitey with those teeth. But, um... Heterodontosaurus, whose name means different toothed reptile. They may have looked something like that. That's interesting that they, uh... They enclosed the Neris on that model. But, yeah. This is the classic Dorling Kindersley model of it that you've probably seen in various dinosaur books before. And there became kind of a trope where this dinosaur is always, like, licking its wrist. Because this model of it at the Natural History Museum in London showed it doing that. So everyone copied it. And you see a lot of older illustrations of this dinosaur licking its wrist. When I was a kid, actually, and first, like, getting into t-shirt design, I don't think I still have it, but I, uh, I did an illustration of this animal. It looks exactly like this, except it's licking an ice cream cone. And, uh... Yeah. I thought that was very funny at the time. But, yeah. Heterodontosaurus. There you go. Good stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's not a big animal. It's really not. Yeah. Not a big critter. Heterodontosaurus. Uh, maybe they got bigger than that? We don't... I don't know if we have what could be definitely a, an adult specimen yet. We honestly need more fossils to figure that out. But yeah. Yeah, anywho. Uh, and I recently took a bunch of photos of this animal and tried this cast that they have at uh, the museum in Berkeley. This week took a bunch of photos of it. That was yesterday, actually. Yesterday, this week, yesterday. Made a photogrammetric model. And, um, in fact, I think I have it. Right here, I do. Yeah, here we go. You see that right there? Yeah. Behold the wonders of photogrammetry. So there is a chance I could even 3D print this. And have a full-size heterodontosaurus skeleton here in my office. But we'll, uh... I'm gonna have to export this and see how detailed it is because... Yeah, it's a little it's a little finicky. But it's it's pretty cool what we can do with um, smartphones nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And you hear this work at song at work almost every day? What song is this? El burrito. Sabanero? Yeah. I'm not familiar with this song, Lena. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I will give you two dollars. 
Reddington, you dare me to do what? I don't, I don't follow. And this is a Christmas song. I was not familiar with that. Look, you know, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Make a fossil copy. I mean, you can get straight on pictures of it online, tactile. Shoot. Heterodontosaurus. There's one right there on Wikipedia. This is actually the same exact cast at Berkeley. Yeah. It's high res, too. Just look it up on Wikipedia. Heterodontosaurus. In fact, here's a link for you. Yeah, very cool. And uh, you could do a relief out of it. Oh, really neat tactile. Very, very cool. Yeah. And Aerospace News says, I see on your about that you're doing dinosaur 3D modeling. Are you creating full animated 3D models with mesh and textures? They're not animated. No, they're for 3D printing. Um, the fossils that you see here, including this guy, are all... 3D printed. This guy. 3D printed. Um, not just Heterodontosaurus right here. Not just Heterodontosaurus, but also Hypsilophodon. And Lesudosaurus. Massospondylus. Cetacosaurus. And Skelidosaurus right here. Yeah. Um, good stuff. These are not minis, these are life size, Rizudego. Yeah, speed overload. There you go, Brannington. Yeah. Speedo, speedo, speedo. Excuse me. Sauropodomorph, Thyreophoran, Ceratopsian. These three are what we call speedos sometimes. That's a term that I learned this summer. It stands for uh, small bodied early diverging ornithischian. Which just means they're a little two-legged, beaky, plant-eating dinosaur. Ran on two legs. Um, oh yeah, mostly not animated. Yeah, they stay pretty still, Moosey Fate. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, all the good stuff, says Ice Allen. Exactly. Yeah, and cute chimkins. There you go, Riddler. I mean... Yeah. Little old guys like our Hypsilophodon right here. They're, um... It's a little beaky critter. Let's call it chicken-like. I'm gonna be, uh, working on these and, and painting them pretty soon, hopefully. But these are some of the things that I've been putting that, uh, 3D printer filament into use for. Bringing these to life so to speak. Yeah, our beaky Cetacosaurus right there. Very nice. And our Skelidosaurus. Thank you again to Creatrix Brit for helping me with these. I didn't know how to repair the models in the slicer software, but Brit told me how to do that, and that's why this was all possible. Including this Skelidosaurus right here. One of the most complete dinosaurs from the UK, Scalidosaurus. So yeah, good stuff. Yeah, we're playing pin the speedo on the speedo. I think we're pastry. Shot corn, that's too good. Oh shoot. Yeah, I didn't know the lacrimals on Scalidosaurus were so sick. They're pretty neat. Yeah, we've got these. Interesting crest horn things on this animal. It's funny, Scalidosaurus, you look at this and it it reminds me of a stegosaur. Especially in the lower jaw right there. But I guess it's if you're an ankylosaur person, it probably looks pretty ankylosaur y too. 
Yeah. Interesting. Anyway. What's the oldest one that I have, says Smay? You mean the dinosaur that's uh, from the earliest in time? Oh boy, without question. That would have to be good old Eoraptor, the Dawn Thief. Dawn, D-A-W-N, not D-O-N. It's not stealing Donalds. Be they ducks or trumps or whatever. Unfortunately, it's dawn like dawn like the dish soap or like, you know, the morning time. The break of dawn. Eoraptor. The dawn thief. Dawn Stealer, Dawn Predator, Eoraptor, right here. You see those beautiful teeth right there? Yeah, big ol' eye socket. I suspect this animal is probably a juvenile, given how enormous those eyes are. But Eoraptor. There we go. Look at those big old eyes. Eoraptor. 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 That's a lovely one there. This is the one of the very earliest dinosaurs we have. In fact, this is, I think, the earliest unequivocal dinosaur that we have. The very first dinosaur to have evolved that we have so far is Eoraptor. It's about 230 million years old. Pretty cool. And, uh... And here's its skull. In fact... I can find you a... a couple of cool photos of it in this book. Good old Eoraptor. There we go. There it is in Louis C. Hoyos' book from 1994. Neoraptor. Yeah. After several months of grain-by-grain -grain removal under a microscope, I have prepared her with a dental pick. The skull of Eoraptor is liberated from its prison of stone. Eoraptor, which means dawn stealer, was pulled from 228 million-year-old sediment and is the most primitive dinosaur discovered to date. And there is my 3D print of it. Right there. Yeah. I feel like they may have reversed it for this photo for whatever reason. And there is Paul Serino holding that on the plane. This is actually pretty interesting in the text here. Yeah. I'll read it to you. In the first class section of United Airlines flight to Toronto, a curious stewardess notices the tiny dinosaur skull resting on a wad of cotton on Paul Serino's dinner tray and asks if he has brought his own breakfast. Paul tells her that it's the most primitive dinosaur ever found, news that the scientific community won't have until an official press conference can be called a few months later. The little dinosaur in seat 4A starts to cause quite a sensation among the crew. Is it male or female? Another excited flight attendant asks. Can't tell, says Paul. Is it a baby dinosaur? asks another, noting its small size. It's the only one, so we have nothing to compare it to, Paul replies. How old is it? asked the pilot. And the pilot came over to, to investigate. Who's flying the plane? Oh, no. Paul tells him that the dinosaur is about a quarter of a billion years old. Uh, and then, revealing the limited concept of time most humans have, the pilot asks, Were people around then? Paul smiles faintly as he gives the pilot a quick lesson in the history of time. The pilot is visibly stunned. He goes back to the controls of his DC-10, shaking his head. Afterward, Paul tells me dinosaurs more than any other fossil group, maybe even fossil humans, give people an idea that something, something truly different, existed in the past. It makes them just a slight bit smaller. Most people have no concept of geologic time. They live in yesterday and today. 
To get your average person to understand that humans didn't exist when dinosaurs existed is a giant leap. In the broadest sense, that's the value of dinosaurs. They teach of times past, open people's eyes to the fact that we are a fleeting moment toward the end of the evolutionary history of life. Pretty cool. Can I hold it? Ask the air traffic controller. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. That's Eoraptor right there. Um. And Brannington says, yes, I love that book. I'm still trying to get through it in my off time. Great book. I read this in the field this summer. And it was cool because at various times I was able to ask Jim Kirkland, you know, whose crew I was on this summer, about various stuff. And uh, Jim appears in this book, too. There he is, holding the skull of Edward Drinker Cope, famed paleontologist. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Um, anyway, so it was cool to be able to, like, just read through this when I would get done with digging for the day, go back to camp, crack open this book, and page through it. I'd never read through it all the way before. And be able to ask Jim and Don and some of their paleontologists there. What do you think about this or that? Jim, what, what was it like when uh, when Luis C. Hoyos handed you Cope's skull? You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, be careful when you're reading through this book because I've had three copies of this book so far and all three of them have split like this. I don't know if it's bad glue or like a cheap binding process or what, but they've all split like this where the the book has come apart at the binding. The binding has fallen apart. So just yesterday I was in Berkeley and they have uh, a copy of this book in the library and I was scanning some of the pages. Theirs has not fallen apart yet, but they those librarians may have worked some magic to keep it from falling apart. I don't know. Maybe they rebound it or something. Anyway. And Technoblade, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing here. It's good to have you. Technoblade says, can you tell me about the world is cheap. of largest dinosaur? The world of largest dinosaur. I'm not sure I know what you mean, Technoblade. You mean what was the world like when the largest dinosaurs were walking around? Is that what you mean? Because I'd be happy to answer that question. Oh, the world's largest dinosaur. Oh, oh, there we go. Technoblade. Yes, that's still a mystery. We're still figuring out what the very largest dinosaur might have been. There's several contenders, but all of them are what we call sauropods. Sauropod dinosaurs are the long-necked, four-legged, plant-eating dinosaurs, like these. So far, it seems like all of the biggest sauropods may have all been titanosaurs from toward the end of the Age of Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs like Patagotitan, right here. Dinosaurs like Argentinosaurus. Dinosaurs like Dreadnoughtus, or Bruhathkaiosaurus, or Alamosaurus are some of the very largest of all the dinosaurs. Yeah. And isn't it just the Loch Ness Monster? There's a distinct difference here. The difference is these dinosaurs are real. The Loch Ness Monster is A, not a dinosaur, and B, not real. Yeah. Um... But anyway, one of the very largest of the dinosaurs is um, uh, Patagotitan. And we can talk about that a little bit. Let's see. Yeah. Here we go. Take a look at this. Yeah. Patagotitan. The largest, biggest dinosaur ever discovered. We don't know that for sure. 
the problem is when we find dinosaurs that are, that are this large, they're never complete. And even if they are complete, you might have to knock down an entire hillside to be able to get all the bones. And sometimes it's just not possible. And so all of the largest dinosaurs like this, we don't have a complete skeleton from any one of them. We've got lots of pieces, but not a 100% complete skeleton. So it's, it's really difficult to say who was the very largest dinosaur. But this is one of them here. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, titanosaurs from the very largest of the dinosaurs. There's Diego Pol. He's one of the paleontologists who described it. Uh, very complete skeleton. There's actually three different skeletons that are made up that one that you saw there. We still don't have a skull or other important elements from this critter. Yeah, but it's uh it's a pretty cool critter. Here, take a look at this in London. A colossal giant that roamed 101 million years ago. The Patagotitan Mayorum is one of the biggest known titanosaurs. Yep. Now squeezing into London's Natural History Museum in an exhibition showing visitors how a 57 ton creature grew I'm gonna start to right. the size yeah. of a grapefruit. In order to sustain a body of that size, they needed to eat a huge amount of food. So they would have been eating almost all day, every day. And they probably needed about 120 kilos of food just, yeah, per day just to sustain their size. So they would have spent most of the time grazing. It was an Argentinian farmer who spotted the first bone in Patagonia in 2010. He called in scientists and over the next two years during a series of digs, they uncovered 280 more. The skeleton is actually bones from six individuals, cast in resin and pieced together like an intricate puzzle. Yep. To get a sense of its size, the titanosaur skeleton is 35 meters long, almost the equivalent of four double-decker buses, and three times the size of a T-Rex. It would have been cool. elephants and humans. Yep. Paleontologists are still learning about how they were able to evolve to become so vast. Hmm. Really fast growth meant they could get to these enormous sizes, and then various aspects of their skeleton meant they could walk around at these large sizes. Huge pillar-like legs, really wide hips that helped stabilize the body, and also they would have had a gigantic heart and a huge gut to help power all of the energy that you need to move that body around. Yep. Look at those cervical ribs. That's nuts. So these are little bony projections that come off of the neck vertebrae here, the neck bones. Each one of these is probably like five or six feet long. That's crazy. Look at that. As well as inspiring Ooh. wonder, this exhibit hopes to also remind people we have our own titans to protect, like the African savanna elephant, which is currently endangered. And by preserving their habitats and preventing illegal poaching, we can stop them from becoming extinct. Charlie Angela Al Jazeera, London. Cool stuff. Yeah. The Patagotitan from Patagonia. The other was from Argentina. Well, Patagonia is a region in Argentina and Chile. So, yeah. Um, Argentina has got some truly incredible places in which to find fossils. The badlands of Patagonia in Argentina are... This is the sort of territory that you want to look for fossils in. If you get the chance. Look at all of that beautiful exposed rock right there on the surface. Most of it from the Cretaceous period. From the age of the dinosaurs. Who knows what's hiding in there. With no trees or parking lots or Walmarts or Tesco's. Whatever the South American equivalent of a Walmart or a Tesco might be to cover it up. Just beautiful exposed rock. 
in which to find important fossils. Yeah. Technoblade says, if we can find hundreds of dinosaur bones around the world, why can't we make a hologram? What do you mean, why can't we? We have, like, many, many times. Shoot, like... Like this here. There you go. Its heart must have been immense. From our new detailed knowledge of the skeleton, John Hutchinson has calculated that it was more than six feet in circumference. This is the same dinosaur, Patago Titan, we were just talking about in that video. Yeah. It probably weighed 230 kilos and would have had to shift... Just the heart. ...liters of blood with a yeah. single beat. There's one. That's funny, Brainington. <laughs> and it would have to repeat that beat. Yeah. five seconds. There it goes again. Yep. Weighing more than three grown men, it would have been extraordinarily powerful. And in order to pump blood around the body at high pressure, and then into the delicate... LiDAR, they're going in space. Pressure, <laughs> It's thought that our titanosaur oh, boy. had four chambers, more like that of a bird than a reptile. So a powerful heart pumped the blood to the extremities of the body, but how did the blood get back? Hmm. As this in is super elephant, cool. A combination of fatty foot pads and tight skin are thought to have forced the blood from its legs all the way back to its heart. Yeah, very cool. And this is a really cool documentary. I used to show this to my students back when I was doing, um, well, when I was teaching preschool and before that, when I was teaching a summer science camp, we would watch this documentary, Attenborough and the Giant Dinosaur. Um... Yeah, can we find a trailer? Oh, maybe not. Here, take a look at this. Yeah. The first sauropods to appear on Earth were comparatively small creatures. This is the cast of the thigh bone of one of them. It's not even as big as my thigh bone. Yep. But after about a big femur, David. 20 million years, some had become He's probably a tall man. This is a thigh bone from one of those creatures. It's probably Platyosaurus or a critter like that? After that, our giant appeared. This... Yeah, so actually, shoot, let me take this opportunity. What does he say? This is the cast of the thigh bone of one of them. So I think this is from a dinosaur like, um... Massospondylus right here. Uh, this is the skull of Massospondylus, 3D printed. There's the eye socket. There's the teeth right there. So, you know, not the biggest dinosaur, but an important one. Massospondylus, very important. It's not got a great big thigh bone. I'm guessing this is a Massospondylus thigh bone. If not, it's the thigh bone of Massospondylus. This critter is a similar size. It's not even as big as my thigh bone. But after about 20 million years, some had become pretty big. And this is a dinosaur that's actually from earlier in time, but nevertheless, Platyosaurus. There is its skull right there. Yeah, it'll be more distinct once it's painted. But um, there you go, Platyosaurus. These critters starting to get bigger, these uh, sauropods. Yeah. This is a thigh bone from one of those creatures. But then, after that, our giant appeared. Yeah. This is Look at its that. thigh bone. Enormous. 
Yeah. Pretty cool. And somebody was asking about VR earlier. We'll take a look at this. So this is VR. I can scroll in right here. Play. Hello, and welcome to the Earth as it was a very long time ago, a hundred million years ago. Well, well, fact, well. Out there in the night sky, there's an asteroid that's on a collision course with the Earth. Uh -oh. If and when it hits, it could wipe out the most extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. <gasps> The dinosaurs. And if dinosaurs had not died, I oh. imagine that mammals would still be small creatures like this living in the nooks and crannies of their world, and we wouldn't be here. Thank you, Technoblade, for the follow. Welcome. But today, we can go and have a look at them ourselves. There's our Patago Titan. Our Titanosaur right there. Oop. Come on. This is... My scroll wheel, sometimes you scroll backwards and it scrolls in. It's real finicky. I guess you can't really expect too much of a mouse that's made of wood. It's not a really a performance piece of equipment, but yeah. A titanosaur. If I was on an ordinary television program, I'd say that it was about 40 meters long which is as long as three double-decker buses in line, and that it could reach up to the top of a five-story building. We can see for ourselves. Shall we? Yeah, we shall. Let's go take a look. Oh, we're moving forward now. Scoot scootin'. Look at that. Yeah. Very nice. At 70 tons, it weighed as much as 15 African bull elephants. And a body that size needs a huge skeleton to support it. I remember that 15 elephants. There we go. These are accurate copies of over 220 bones that were discovered in Patagonia in 2013. To keep such a huge body supplied with blood needed an immense heart. It weighed three times as much as I do. And Holy cow. It circulate 90 liters of blood with a single beat. That's pretty astonishing. Fed into its lungs. Yeah. So it could extract oxygen both when it breathed in and when it breathed out. Some birds, the closest living relatives of dinosaurs, have a similar sort of system. Pretty cool. And unusually, these enormous thighs had huge tendons running through them, which were connected to the tail. So it could help in lifting its trunk-sized legs. Yeah, those cotofemoralis muscles. And there it goes. The largest animal ever to walk on our planet. Pretty cool. It truly was an extraordinary creature. Who knows how many more await discovery lying in the earth. Or indeed, are still around. <laughs> anyway, if you would like to take a look at this yourself, here is a link that I'm going to put in the chat for you. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, and they ribs seem wider space than I would have expected. Titanosaurs have got huge barrel-shaped rib cages. It's kind of nuts. 
how wide their the rib cage could get. So yeah, yeah. That's as many as five tens. There you go, Rosand. Yeah, fifty five tens. So yeah. Anyway, a big critter, Patago Titan. It's uh, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. The veins must have been so thick for that blood pressure. Oh, you betcha, pizza guy. Oh yeah. What an incredible animal. In fact. There was a talk that I was watching. I didn't finish it, but I was listening to it as I was doing laundry today. Um, by Jeff Wilson, who is a... Wilson have two L's? Google Chrome is terrible at this sometimes. Um, Like, do I have to go into the search history in YouTube? I guess I do. Um, uh, let me just find it here. Let me search for it. Yeah, there we go. I searched sauropod and it didn't come up. But anyway, if you'd like to find out how these animals could get so very large... There's a talk by Jeff Wilson about this that I just started watching. Uh, that's a classic image from Roland T. Bird, who was a paleontologist that was interested in fossil trackways. And so here you see a young boy taking a bath in a sauropod footprint. Pretty cool stuff. Um, anyway, here is a link to that talk if you're interested in it. There you go. Yeah. Um, and reanimated bit says, Danny, on the topic of the blood return, he mentioned that their feet assisted in the process by moving. They did this. So elephants. Here, let me see if I can find this. Um, can I find a clip? a little gross. Um, okay. Here is paleontologist John Hutchinson Models of living. talking about sauropods. Can we... Is there a part where he's talking about elephants, maybe? There's a clip from that Attenborough documentary where John Hutchinson talks about elephant legs. We don't have the whole thing on YouTube, do we? Um, shoot, I don't think we do. Anyway, there's a clip in that documentary. But basically, elephants have got very tight skin around their legs. probably seen this before it almost seems kind of like squeezed around their legs they've got very very tight skin uh and that basically like forces the blood back up their legs it's almost like wearing compression socks so if you're a person who's got very long legs then maybe you have to wear compression socks when you say you have to sit for a long time like on a plane or a train or something like that elephants have basically got the same kind of thing Full time, thin like like compression socks exactly HD yeah yeah, um and it forces the blood back up their legs so it doesn't pool at the bottom of you know down in their feet. Um, that's part of it and part of it is those fleshy foot pads where they step on them and that also I guess helps pump the blood back in but I don't understand that nearly as well. The compression socks thing makes intuitive sense to me. I'm not sure about the other stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Gimp Leg, you're here right now. Speaking of legs. We've got Ineasaurus. 
in our stream title for the day. We've got to talk about this dinosaur that you requested a deep dive on yesterday, Gimpleg. So let's get to it, shall we? Ineosaurus. Can we find a video on this critter, perhaps? My Neosaurus. No, maybe not. Let's check this out from Dinosaur Planet here. All right, it's a little loud. They're ceratopsian dinosaurs. Hmm. Anyway, Ineosaurus. It's a dinosaur which was named by Scott Sampson. I guess that's maybe one of the reasons why it was included in Dinosaur Planet, huh? But dug up by Jack Horner and his crew back in the 90s, I believe. There's a beautiful Ineosaurus right there. Really, really lovely. So this is a dinosaur related to other horned dinosaurs that you might be familiar with, like Triceratops. But Ineosaurus has got this big old horn that comes off of its nose. It almost looks like a can opener or something like that. It was originally, I think, thought to be a, a different species of Styracosaurus. Until it was named as a new genus back in the early 2000s or late 90s. Ineosaurus. The name, as I recall, means buffalo lizard or bison lizard. I Neo, I believe, is uh, Blackfoot language for for buffalo or bison. I, I Neo or I Nee, something like that. But yeah, I Neosaurus. This is a dinosaur that would have lived in the same time and the same place as Despletosaurus, like you saw earlier, but also Myasaura, whom we were talking about yesterday. I Neosaurus, really, really cool critter. Let's see if we can find the original descriptive paper for this animal, given that this is a dinosaur deep dive. I love to show off the original literature whenever we get the chance. So whenever my computer feels compelled to bring that up, there we go. Ineosaurus. There we go. In the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, back in 1995, December 27th, 1995. Two new horned dinosaurs in the Upper Cretaceous II Medicine Formation of Montana. With a phylogenetic analysis of the Chasmosaurin, uh, Centrosaurin, excuse me. Uh, yeah. The Dinosaur Society actually helped fund part of this research, which is really cool. They're not around anymore, unfortunately, the Dinosaur Society. But there's that that nose horn of Ineosaurus right there. Yeah. Uh, um, there we go. Ineosaurus procurvicornis. This is the original descriptive paper for this animal. This is the first time that Ineosaurus as such was published on. This is the original... Well, there's Achillosaurus right there. Achillosaurus horneri. Named after Jack Horner, my old boss. And 
And there is Aeneasaurus. Beautiful. Yeah. Pizza Guy says we can make our own dinosaur society. I don't think we can. People have tried, and I think they got sued because the term dinosaur society is copyrighted, unfortunately. Maybe you have to add an S. Maybe it has to be dinosaurs society. But yeah. There's the skull from the top and from the side. Yeah. And there's Achillosaurus. So, at least similar looking animal. They are close relatives. Achillosaurus seems to be closer to Pachyrhinosaurus. Aeneasaurus may have actually evolved into Achillosaurus. I'm not totally sure. Yeah. But yeah, here's some other dinosaurs, including Styracosaurus. I seem to recall that maybe Aeneasaurus was originally thought to be a species of Styracosaurus. It may have even been published on as such back in the early 90s. But yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, there's that original paper. Cool. Aeneasaurus. Very cool animal. There's some lovely artwork of it right there. It it kind of makes you wonder whether the horns of horned dinosaurs actually evolved for defense. Were these really anti-predator defensive implements? Or did they evolve primarily for display? This would imply that it's primarily for display. That's not really the right shape horn for stabbing a tyrannosaur with. It is sharp, I guess. But you look at other horned dinosaurs like, um... Pachyrhinosaurus. You know, that does not seem like a very effective anti-predator weapon right there. Not very... not good for spearing predators with. You know? Yeah. Does not look effective for combat. I agree. Neither this guy... Or this guy. So it leads me to think that this probably evolved for... For showing off, rather than for... You know... Uh... For combat. For fighting. You know? There's Aeneasaurus. Wow, this would have been not too long after the animal was first published. Back in... 1997 in James Gurney's uh, World of Dinosaurs stamps issued by the U.S. Postal Service. Here. Here we are. Aeneasaurus is one of very few dinosaurs that's ever actually appeared on a U.S. postage stamp. There we go. There's the World of Dinosaur Stamps. And there is good old Aeneasaurus right there. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So yeah, yeah. Very few dinosaurs have had the honor of becoming U.S. Postal Service Stamps. Aeneasaurus is one of them. Yeah. Uh, what else to say about this critter? It's kind of funny because this is like a whole flurry of different Ceratopsian dinosaurs, which were, um, you know, published in the 90s up until today. And, uh, oh, shoot. Ugh. I guess don't ask AI to try and depict this dinosaur, or it'll get it very, very badly wrong. That's... This is... Oh, I think I'm gonna be sick. I'm sorry, chat. Oh, boy. 
Ugh. Kill it with fire. Oh my goodness. That's horrendous. It, you know, if you want to depict a, a dinosaur, you know, have a, an artist do it. Don't ask a computer to do it. That's... Ban I uh, agreed, gift lag. Oh, goodness. Yeah. How much better? Yeah. Anyway. I Neosaurus. Um, this is one of those dinosaurs that was on display at Museum of the Rockies, where I, uh, where I used to work. Let's see if I can find you a picture of that. Um... I guess it isn't there anymore. There's, uh... Keelosaurus? Yeah. Anyway. But, yeah. Cool critter, Ineosaurus. I've heard rumors that there is... There are possible eggs and nests of this animal. Haven't been published on yet. Like Myasaura in the two medicine formation that shares its same time, same place as Ineosaurus. These animals may have also had nesting colonies where they all gathered together and laid their eggs in the same place. Just like colonial nesting birds do today. Pretty neat really need more crews out there doing work in those localities because they've I don't know if they've really uh, they've really been worked recently anyway Aeneasaurus is one of those dinosaurs where if we had more funding if we had more people out there to dig up these fossils we could discover incredible things about the, the biology of these critters Unfortunately, we just don't have that right now. You know? Yeah. Was it in this video here? Hmm. Might be here. I'm trying to find this part with Jack Horner talking about. Dinosaur nesting and pelicans and etc. Might be here. Here we go. This is a different dinosaur from the same formation called Myasaura. Um, but it's also from, yeah, same time, same place, same part of Montana, the same rocks. In northern Montana, paleontologist Jack Horner is studying the smallest versions of these creatures with the help of a band of volunteers. So, shall we go to work? When he was uh. seven years old, Horner found his first fossil bones on his family's Montana ranch. He's been hooked ever since. Well, get up here and tell me about it. Well, what is it? It's a bone. What kind of a bone? A tibia. From what? A hadrosaur. Is it from a baby? <laughs> no. No, right. It's from an adult. So you know it's an adult duckbill dinosaur? Mm hmm. Right? Yeah. And did it live here? It's yeah. a bomb. <laughs> Is that what the closed caption said, Lenina? Shoot. Oh. 
If it dies, yeah. then you'd see all the rest around it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Swing and a miss. Yeah. See? see, you know more than you think you do. <laughs> But it's not just professors and students who find bones. Yep. Brandvold runs a rock shop in Bynum, Montana. Anyway, we were... I was going to continue with this, and we we're going to talk about dinosaur eggs and everything, but this just reminded me, it might be helpful at some point to create a supercut of different instances of non-paleontologists making important dinosaur discoveries. Like here. But it's not just professors and students who find bones. Marion Branvold runs a rock shop in Bynum, Montana. Yep. That's why she's out here prospecting, looking for rocks, especially rocks with fossil bones. So she discovered Myasaura originally. Marion Branvold was the person who originally discovered Myasaura. She didn't necessarily recognize it as something important at first, but she found it. In spring 1978, she came across something she'd never seen before in that area. Yeah. I come on down off the hill, and uh, here I was, right close here were some big bones. And I thought, hmm, I thought I've walked here before, but I must not have done. So I'm kind of excited about them, but then there was this odd little round place. Now it looks a lot different today. It's not anyway near the same. And on the top were a few, quite a few scattered small bones. Okay, hmm. them small bones were different than anything I had seen up in this area. Yeah, she knew they were different. Jack Horner took the summer off from Princeton University to go bone hunting with his friend Bob Michaela. Yeah, we were actually just talking about this yesterday, weren't we? Shoot, with Jack Horner um, and dyslexia and, like, what it takes to be a scientist. You don't have to be a super genius to be a scientist you just have to be driven and curious and work hard you know as usual one of their stops was the rock shop run by marion branvold they'd heard that marion needed help identifying some fossil bones so we got to looking around and man she had a lot of fossils in there and a lot of them were misidentified so we we started identifying stuff for her, and she seemed to be real pleased about that. They asked me if I had any other bones that they could look at, and I said, well, we just found some little bones up on the hill. I said, we don't know just what they are. I looked at it, and I'm sure I had a surprised look in my face. Turned to Bob, and I said, Bob, do you know what I'm thinking? Bob <laughs> says, yeah, I know what you're thinking. I was really excited. Bob and I were both really excited, but we were in a rock shop, and in rock shops they sell things, and so we were trying really hard to sort of contain our excitement. And I thought to myself, something's here I got to know about. And Bob picked up a little dentary with teeth in it, and he looked at it, and he, his mouth fell open, and he said, you're right, Jack, this is a baby dinosaur. <laughs> I says, baby dinosaurs? Yes. We were very excited. <laughs> very cool. Here, I'll I'll give you a link so you can watch the rest of this if you'd like. But this reminds me, just like Charlie's Dragon said, conspiracy theorists would say she's just a hired actor to say she found it. Oh boy. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about actually. Uh Let's see. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it on YouTube. Oh boy. Uh oh, I might have to go to uh to Twitter to find this. Delve into that uh, social meteor. Oh boy. Uh, I guess to get us into the uh, 
into the proper spirit for the next segment, let's play this little video sting here, shall we? Here we go. So I'm not on Tink Tonk, really. Thank goodness. <sighs> yeah. But, um... Yeah, here. We're gonna delve into this a little bit. Fair warning right here. Fair warning. There's gonna be... Some slightly... Not family-friendly language here. But given that this is from a person who should not be emulated at all, this is a thing of shame. You know, any kids who are watching this, don't, don't repeat this language. You don't want to. You don't want to be... You do not want to bring shame upon your family in the same way that, that this adult woman has. Uh... Yeah. Here. Um, hang on. Let's take a look. The whole reason I think it might be interesting to make a super cut of, like, different documentary clips and, you know, news broadcasts and stuff like that of, like, people who are not paleontologists finding dinosaur fossils is because of this. Because you've got, you know, shall we say, um... What's a nice word for somebody who isn't very bright? Um, we've got people who are not very bright making videos like this and getting millions and millions of views. Ill-informed. Um, that's, that's one way to put it, Caravan. Yeah. Not the sharpest spine on the Kentrosaurus, you might say. Not the sharpest... Uh, you know... Epiosification on the Ineosaurus, you might even say. Let's take a look. Something we were going to talk about the other day, and I kind of forgot. Dinosaurs actually existed. Wouldn't their bones be everywhere? Let's. I mean, they kind of are. Dinosaur fossils are everywhere where dinosaurs lived, where those rocks that were deposited back then are exposed to the surface today. I mean, they are. Let's all put our critical thinking skills to the test this morning. So why is it that the average Joe has never dug them up? This is the, this betrays an incredible ignorance here. Where it might be roughly half of all of the really important dinosaur discoveries ever made were ha those happened by non paleontologists, non professionals just kind of stumbling across dinosaur fossils. This happened with Sue, the T-Rex that we were talking about earlier, now at the Field Museum in Chicago. This happened with the Wonkel Rex, that other Tyrannosaurus specimen, um, discovered by Kathy Wonkel, Montana rancher, back in uh, 1989. It happened with Myasaura and Marion Branvold, like we just saw in that clip. I mean, yeah. Yeah, Charlie's Dragon says, yeah, she doesn't know enough of this topic to speak on it. I can understand her skepticism when she doesn't know those things, but Google is free. That's the thing, is that in the age of the internet, the wealth of human knowledge is available at anyone's fingertips. And yet, she clearly knows how to use Google. Double Tribble says, I think she may be trolling, maybe, except 
I don't know. I've I've seen videos of people trolling before, like the whole Christians against dinosaurs thing on YouTube and Facebook. That I'm convinced is a joke, a hoax. That that's somebody pulling our legs. If you look at this lady's other content, which I have, she has fallen completely down the rabbit hole. She also thinks that the earth is flat and that uh, governments are spraying chemtrails and that vaccines are mind control devices and everything else. You know, I think she's legitimately deluded, unfortunately. There isn't that... There also just isn't that same kind of kind of joyousness, that glee and like knowing that you're you're in on, you know, some kind of silly joke like this. Like instead it's kind of a smug self satisfaction. Where I think this might just be somebody who's really not very bright, but who thinks that she's stumbled upon some sort of you know, incredible truth. There's not that kind of mischief in her demeanor that you would expect from somebody who's trolling. You know? I could be wrong, but I don't get that impression from her at all. Yeah. So why is it that the average Joe has never dug them up? All the time we have. You or I or anyone we know ever found a bone? I mean... I think this is really funny because I have, and I've live streamed it here on Twitch. <laughs> uh, half the people I know have found fossils before because I'm a paleontologist, and these are the circles that I run in, you know? I suppose if you're a, a TikTok truther, you probably don't know anybody outside of your suburban town who's ever done anything cool like that but yeah yeah um yeah um that being said i don't personally know anybody whose silicone implants have uh spontaneously migrated or burst but you know, if you're in certain parts of suburbia, you probably have several people in your friend group who, uh, maybe that's happened, you know? Different strokes for different folks. We run in different circles. You, you encounter different people, you know? Yeah. And another thing, bones can completely decay within 20 years. And somebody said, well, shoot, doesn't she know about Google? She does know about Google. <laughs> And bones can completely decay within 20 years. It's totally a thing. You leave bones out on the surface of the ground, and within a couple of decades, they'll be sun damaged, they'll be damaged by freeze thaw. just being out in the elements, they will completely decompose. That's why fossils have to be... That's why bones have to be buried in order to become fossilized in the first place. Again, this is... Uh, she could definitely benefit from watching a video like this. Yeah, uh, a step-by-step -step guide on becoming a fossil. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a fossil. Step one, die. Yep. Once you are dead, your remains may be scavenged by other organisms. Or they could be destroyed by wind and rain and sleet and the elements. You got to get buried to become a fossil, you know? And Rizodego says rodents enjoy a cache of calcium just sitting there waiting to be chewed. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Caravan says if you slaughter an animal, it, its meat rots within hours. Therefore, the meat counter at the supermarket is fake. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Step two, uh. get buried fast. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. And Catangel Arts makes an interesting point here. I say, okay, I live in Scotland. I grew up next to a town called Elie? 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 A Ailey? How do you say that, Katangel? Ailey has famous beaches for people finding all kinds of fossils. People travel from around the world to visit and find 
Ely. There we go. Ely. Nice. It's funny. We've got another town called Ely here in the States. Ely, Nevada. I was there, uh... I passed through there this summer on the way back from doing field work, digging up dinosaurs in Utah. Th this is also spelled, or pronounced Ely, but different spelling. And there's Ely, Minnesota, too. Interesting, Bet Medler. Okay. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Contangial Art says people travel from all over the world to find... To visit and find small fossils. Yeah. This is the thing. This is, I think, a big part of what I'll call TikTok brain here is just being spending too much time on the internet, too much time online, not enough time out in the real world, talking to people, going out and doing things, you know? At least for certain people, the internet has a tendency to kind of melt their brains. You know? It kind of brings out the worst in people and brings their prejudices, their suspicions, their, their ignorance to the forefront and, and makes them content about that, you know? I'm also here on the internet, here on Twitch, but I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to expand people's horizons. I'm trying to answer people's questions and I'm trying to combat this kind of nonsense here. You know? <sighs> Aerospace News says confirmation bias in a tiny population of contacts and information sources. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And Echidna says, the idiotic idea of, if I didn't experience it, it doesn't exist, slash isn't true. There you go. You would hope that being exposed to the, the sum total of human knowledge, having the Library of Alexandria times a billion at your fingertips, you know, available through a few strokes on your keyboard, you would think that this would expand people's horizons. And for many people, many people who are here in chat right now, that is true. Many people use the internet for good things, like learning or experiencing new things. Like you, Dex Phantom Hawk. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. But I don't know. Unfortunately, if you're just oh, so eager to be fooled, if you really, really want to be wrong about stuff, then the internet can also help you with that. And that seems to be the case here. Uh, okay, within 20 years. So we, we talked about this. Oh, yeah, how to become a fossil. Here, shoot. Let's, let's start this over from the beginning. It's short. Here's a You'll step like it. Step guide to becoming a fossil. Oh. Step one, die. There's a trilobite there. Once you are dead, your remains may be scavenged by other organisms. Step two, get buried fast. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. Your best bet for rapid burial is to die near or in a river, lake, or ocean. Yep. Where water Although other places sometimes work too. Sometimes you get aeolian deposition where like wind blown sand can bury something. Uh, occasionally it'll happen by a mudslide or um, yeah, something like that. But most fossils, certainly not all, certainly not all, but most fossils that we find were buried by sediment that was carried in by water. Whether that's a river, a stream, a creek, the bottom of an ocean, etc. Um, although it's really cool when we have fossils that are deposited by sand dunes and stuff, too. Yeah. Deposit sediment over you. Step three, soak in groundwater for a long, long time. Yep. Groundwater contains minerals. So this is the thing. If you were just the original material, it would rot away after a while. So she's correct about that. 
But fossilization is what makes the difference here. Fossilization is when some of those original organic materials in your bone are replaced by minerals in the groundwater, minerals in the surrounding rock, etc. Over time, dissolved minerals can harden after filling in cavities in your skeleton. Yep. Or the water can dissolve your skeleton, leaving only minerals in its place. Mm -hmm. Either way, your skeleton will turn to stone and you'll be a fossil. Yep. Step four, wait to be exposed. As the years go by, if you're lucky, sea levels can fall or That's rock really neat, can erode. That's really neat, Arts. I'll check out that link in a second. Yeah. Then, if your luck holds out, you might get spotted by a fossil hunter and wind up in a museum collection where scientists can study you to learn about evolution. Very cool. Very cool indeed. Like has happened many times, apparently, here in the UK. Uh, in Ely, there are two locations for fossils at Ely. The first is Ely Shore, where during scouring conditions in winter months, brachiopods, bivalves, and sponges, and trilobite fragments can be found. Trilobites just like the one we saw in that video. Nearby the rocks at Woodhaven also contain fossils. Very cool stuff. So this is a place where you can go and dig fossils. So our... Our Tink Tonk friend here... She could literally go there and dig up her own fossils. You know? And Pizza Guy says, Not me, I'm way too ugly to put up in a museum. I doubt that's true, Pizza Guy. You might be very important in a future museum someday. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> uh, these people are finding fossils that are intact. They're often not intact. It's, it's pretty rare to find a fossil that's not damaged in some way. You know, and if she knew anything at all about this before making a TikTok video about it, which has been shared millions of times, apparently, then she would understand that, you know? They still have teeth attached? This is a replica right here. This is not an actual fossil. So it's really, really funny. She's like, oh, well, these are fossils that are intact? Like, that. this is... I'm not even sure what this is supposed to be. Is this supposed to be Giganotosaurus? Doesn't look like Allosaurus right here. Doesn't look like our Allosaurus. See how the lacrimal crest on Allosaurus? That doesn't protrude as far. This is probably supposed to be Giganotosaurus here. But this is a replica. Like in a children's sandbox kind of deal. This looks like it's supposed to be a... Like a children's dig site thing in a playground. Again, same with that uh, that one right there. This is, actually, this is like Photoshop. This actually looks like a fish tank uh, decoration right here. Like, it really looks like... Um, it really looks like one of these. It's just, it's sad she does not know what she's talking about. This is an actual legitimate baby Chasmosaurus skeleton. So this is real at least. And we can find a video about that right here. Several videos actually. Here we go with Phil Curry. How significant ontogenetic changes are within a dinosaur species. Yeah, ontogeny. We have fairly complete skeletal remains of both adults and the infants of the same species. As yep. you can imagine, acquiring both skeletons of young and old specimens of the same species can be quite challenging. Sometimes, though, we get lucky. Ontogeny. Hiking through the Badlands of Alberta, I've made many exciting, wonderful discoveries over the years, but this one is one of my favorites. And so Phil Curry has been digging dinosaurs up in Canada for like 50 years. He found this. So this is an example of a paleontologist. One of the most famous pale dinosaur paleontologists in the world. But yeah, he found this himself. Oftentimes these things are found by amateurs, members of the public. Yeah. And you're from Alberta there, pizza guy? Yeah. Phil Curry. In the summer of 2010, I was going up. Uh, most famous dinosaur paleontologist 
of the frill coming out of the cliff. And when I looked at it, I thought, you know, that kind of looks like a ceratopsian skull, but uh, I realized that my chances of finding a skull that small were not very good. Yeah. And I uh, rationalized to myself this was probably a turtle rather than a, a skull I've at all. I've done the same thing and, and had it turn out to be a ceratopsian. And by the end of the day, had uncovered most of the skull, and there was no question this was one of the most exciting discoveries we've made in recent years. Yeah, very cool. Here's a link if you want to watch the rest of this, but we're going to get back on topic here. That's that same specimen right there that she uh, she used in her Tink Tonk. From 76 million years ago. Yeah. Some dinosaurs lived 76 million years ago. Some dinosaurs lived 66 million years ago. Some dinosaurs lived 225 million years ago. I mean, you can say it all incredulously, but that's not an argument, you know? And if you're watching this video and have found a dinosaur bone, I would love to hear it. I am tempted. You know, I don't, chat, I do not spend a lot of time on TikTok, but I'm kind of tempted to do a response to this at some point. I don't know. I'm so busy this month. My, uh. I'm going on a big trip across state lines this weekend, and then I've got a big talk that I've got to give next week, it looks like, and I don't know, maybe next week after my birthday I can find time to do this. We'll see. We'll see. Dark Mock Rises says, don't do it, Danny. It's a trap? I don't know. Sounds like it could be fun. I'd love to hear the story. Message me. I maybe I should. Maybe I should. Honestly, believe they put these creatures in front of us and made they. Ooh, they put these creatures in front of us. Who is the? I wonder. Who is the they that they're talking about here? That she's talking about. Who are these shadowy forces? They put these creatures in front of us. Hmm. I wonder if she would think that I'm part of this grand conspiracy here. Uh, the Illuminati, Katangel, there you go. Yeah, the lizard people, the Freemasons. Um, they, says Lenina, exactly. Yeah. I'm kind of tempted to reply to this. I am kind of tempted. You know? The NB agenda. <laughs> Chuck one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, don't feed the trolls. I mean, what if we're taking food from the trolls, Golganek? Or eating some of the food that was given, handed to the trolls? What if we eat some of that food, those views ourselves? I don't know. I'm kind of tempted us. believe it because of this oh boy so she's one of these people who doesn't believe in dinosaurs but is very enthusiastic about very badly photoshopped giant human skeletons oh boy oh boy you know what let's um let's see if we can find this on snopes real quick yeah let's see if we can find this exact same photo maybe Well, this might be one of the same ones that she'll show, but a bad Photoshop here. False. Yeah. So there's the Photoshopped image. And I guess they don't have the original there, but for some of these, they also have the original. Yeah. False. False. 
Anyway. Yeah. You're all sophisticated viewers here. I don't have to tell you that this stuff... ...is nonsense what she's talking about here. You know? Yeah. Um... And Roseanne says, before replying, you need to ask yourself whether you think they would engage in good faith conversation. Oh, she would definitely not. No, she's uh, loco for Choco Puffs, this lady. Completely off the deep end. Um, but the thing is, if I can do, what do they call it on TikTok? A duet or something like that? And, you know, maybe that would gain some traction and we can use this to actually spread good science information. I'm not expecting to actually convince this wackadoo of anything. Um, she's just going to call me a lizard person or whatever. Or I don't know. Who knows what she's going to say? Frankly, I don't really care. But my mission is to try and get good science information out there to the public. And if this is an avenue to do that, then that's an avenue I want to pursue. We'll see. Danny can fix her, I'm sure, says Dark Mock Rises. I'm not convinced of that. Sometimes you can't fix, you know, somebody who doesn't want to be fixed. See how how careful I was in saying that? Anyway. After all, yeah. all of our fallen ancestors have always talked about the Nephilim. What? The fallen angels. Yeah. Big ass giants. And if the meteor thing truly happened, if something of that magnitude was to hit Earth, it'd be something like 10,000 nuclear bombs going on. Nuclear bombs. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, uh... How didn't everything get obliterated? So this is one of those things that I don't understand about TikTok, is that something like this can be spread far and wide, and it's such low production quality. She put next to zero effort into making this. So where it's just got, like, bad cuts, like, in between this shot and the, the next shot of her talking, there's, like, a shot that she forgot to edit out? How right there. Do you, do you see that? One more time. One more time. This is one of the reasons why I I really don't like TikTok. It's just It's not like the the best parts rise to the surface, you know, like sometimes happens sometimes on places like YouTube and Twitch and stuff. It's just like absolute garbage is allowed to float to the top. It's promoted and it it's weird. It's weird. I don't get it. I don't get how somebody feels comfortable posting something like that, too. Maybe it's just the very beginning of that medium, and, like, you still so you still get crud that, that rises to the top. Maybe in future years this will no longer be the case, but I don't know, man. I don't know. How didn't everything get obliterated? There wouldn't be anything left, let alone bones. It's and again, it's like... She doesn't realize that... Well, yes, the that asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous period was devastating. Especially near Ground Zero, now the, near the actual impact itself. But the world is a big place. It was something like between 60 and 90% of life on Earth died out at the end of the Cretaceous period from that asteroid impact and the ensuing ecological devastation. But... Life went on after that eventually, you know? It did cause the extinction of, say, the non-avian dinosaurs, and the mosasaurs, and the plesiosaurs, and several groups of ancient mammals, most groups of ancient birds, um, you know, several groups of fishes and sharks and invertebrates. Ammonites went completely extinct. It was absolutely devastating. But again, we're here talking about details and... You know, this is somebody just spouting off nonsense. And the thing is, with somebody spouting off nonsense, he or she can say whatever they like. 
and it could just be like that. You could talk all kinds of nonsense real fast. It takes a lot longer to actually talk about details, get things right. There's an old quote that, like, uh, what is it? It's like, a lie can make its way all the way around the world while the truth is still getting its pants on. Like, a falsehood can travel the globe while the real facts are still pulling on their trousers. It, and it's true. What I'm talking about right here, this, we've gone so much longer in this little segment here, actually talking about what's real than the whole length of this video. We keep pausing it. It's what, a uh, minute 57 seconds? How long have we been going with this discussion so far? It's a lot longer. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. It could be real quick to spout nonsense, but to actually try and be intellectually honest and talk about stuff like evidence, show proof, it takes a lot longer than that. Another reason why I really dislike TikTok is because it's so fast. It's just punching you in the face relentlessly with all of this stimulus, and it just gives me a headache. I'm just not built for that. Maybe, you know, the next generation of feral iPad children, you know, they're just they're bred with this kind of thing, you know? They're raised on it from birth, but I don't know. Maybe that makes me an old man. I'm not sure. But it just it doesn't drive with me. It's easy to connect the dots once your eyes are open. It's just another thing they made up to keep us from the truth. Truth is, giants existed. <laughs> oh boy, there's a big sword right there. That looks long and skinny. Why does this guy also look really long and skinny? Was this photograph stretched, perhaps? Uh you can't make this stuff up. It's, oh boy. Uh... Truckhorn says, no, Danny, it's proof giants exist. There you go. Yeah. Who is they? Apparently me, Risa Degu. That's the thing. There is a, I can't show you this video because there's, uh, it does go a little bit beyond the, uh, the, like, family-friendly. You know, all ages mission of, uh, of this channel. But this guy, you might remember him Andrew Callahan, Cal Callahan, Callahan. Anyway, he visited a flat Earth convention a while ago, and the really funny thing is, there's the link there in the in the chat if you want to look at it. But he goes around and like talks to these different people, flat Earth believers. Um. Yeah, and the the funny thing is, pretty much every one of these people he talks to, they all turn out to be like Nazi sympathizers. Like, it's really crazy. Maybe I can show you this one right here. You got a Kimmel and you got a Fallon, and I think both of those are Jewish back names. What we're standing on here is not what they told us it is. The whole thing Oh, boy. How do you stand on Hitler? Do you, do you believe in, if you research Hitler at all? Hitler uh, was demonized by these Rothschild bankers. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Th there is a pipeline that funnels people into that group. Exactly, Pizza Guy. And, uh... Yeah. And yep, Caravan, these things rarely are isolated. If you believe in one really crazy thing, 
Like, uh, oh, Barack Obama actually killed JFK, or the moon is made of cheese, or volcanoes are just holograms, or whatever. You're so much more likely to believe in other crazy things, too. And, uh... Yeah, that's the thing. Anyway, the reason I talk about that is that the they that she mentions. There we go. See anything left, let alone bones. It's easy to connect the dots once your eyes are open. It's just another thing they made up to keep us from the truth. They. It'd be really interesting to ask her, who do you mean by... They, because usually when you boil it down, when you get down to the core of it, conspiracy theorists, especially like flat earthers or people who claim to be dinosaur deniers or whatever else, it usually turns into some sort of anti Semitic conspiracy theory. The infant, the adult. I'm a shandy. Ontogeny. Thank you for the 23 months of support. I really appreciate that, I'm a shandy. Thank you, thank you. It's good to have you here. Yeah. So anyway, don't be like this. Uh, I realize I don't have to tell you that. Everyone who's here and the audience right now. People like you, Amish Andy, and, and Lenina, and Aerospace News, and me and Mia Koda, Sidor, Baja Spencer, everybody. Thank you for helping me do what I do here. And thank you for, for helping me combat this kind of thing in my own small way. You know? When I first heard about Twitch, I wondered about its potential for uh, for science outreach. And it turns out to be pretty wonderful for that application, for talking to folks about fossil science. Thanks for keeping me here on the air and allowing me to do that for uh, three years now. This is how I make my living. I could not do it about your financial support, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, I am I feel incredibly blessed to be able to do this full time. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Oh, likewise, Lenina. Thank you. Yeah. Aerospace News says, what you do is pure magic. You time travel and bring the past to share with all of us. I appreciate the sentiment there, Aerospace News, but... Magic. It's nothing arcane or unexplainable. It's science. And you can do it, too. Anyone can. That's what's so cool about science, is that... It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, where you live in the world... Dinosaur's life. Science is universal. It works no matter who you are, no matter what your beliefs are. The idea of testing hypotheses. That's a universal thing. And it's pretty cool. Thanks for letting me share that with you. Blind06, thank you for the two months of support. Thank you for keeping me here online for the past two months. I appreciate it, Blind. I appreciate it very, very much. Another word for wonder. There you go. Yes. It's something transcendent. Magical, beautiful aerospace news. Yeah. Well, thank if you're you. feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dice. And thank you, Science Streams, for those hundred bits. Holy cow. Hype train here. Holy moly. I appreciate that. Well, we'll see if we can get any closer to our uh, our weekly sub goal here. 
Um, thank you, Science Streams, for those hundred bits. It, it means a lot to me. Thank you, Belinda. Uh, uh, me and Mia Dakota says my phone keeps buffering, so I might be a little behind. No worries. But I think many social media platforms have so much potential. They just need those who are passionate about knowledge to be there. Not to say that you should be on a platform you don't want to be, but I follow a lot of great accounts on TikTok and Twitter that focus on science, and they'll make me so happy. My jaw dropped when I finally found it here on Twitch. Try blaming the dinosaurs. That's 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 beautiful, Mia. Thank you for for saying that. Maybe I should devote some time to to TikTok. You know? Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if I have time. I've got a lot going on, but we'll see. Thank you, Golganak, for those 200 bits. Thank you very much, Golganak. Thank you, Rockophile, for those 100 bits. That is excellent. And Catangel Arts found the picture that she used. <laughs> there it is right there. And that's really funny because she... I guess the source that she used... I doubt she did this herself. But she... Uh, it's all stretched out here. Where was it? Yeah. So the doctored image? The original. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ceremonial swords, not the swords of giants. We probably know who this sword was was created for back in the day. This is probably not knowledge that's lost to history. And yet, hucksters and charlatans will try and use this to say, Oh, well, there were giant humans back then. Uh, just the incredible... Uh, ignorance just makes my head spin. It's it's nuts. Yeah, and it's all in the placard. There you go, Katangel. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for posting that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was the point of stretching it? DJ Displacer? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Gamer's Tavern Show says, I always love when they show the giant staircases, which I think we're right here. There we go. Yeah, they look like terraces that are for agriculture, for planting crops. See the actual stairs people walk on the sides? There you go. Yeah. Uh, I might have to go to the museum and take a picture with it for you. I'd appreciate that, Contangial Arts. Yeah. Whatever excuse you, you use to, to go to a museum and, and bask in that wonder. You know, drink that in. Yeah. I endorse this idea, heartily. Yeah, we visit this museum with our daughter every few weeks. That's very cool, Catangel Arts. That's very cool. The museums are, of course, some of my favorite places in the whole world. Especially natural history museums, but I'm very much a museum person myself, and I, uh... It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Doki Doki Baka says, Sword was actually used by a T-Rex to increase its reach while attacking its enemies. Yeah, there you go. It's not like it had a gigantic deadly head filled with all kinds of incredible massive teeth for subduing its prey. No, swords. That makes sense. <laughs> this is a Tyrannosaurus tooth cast right here. This is a cast of the Tooth of B-Rex, one of the Tyrannosaurus specimens from Museum of the Rockies, Bozeman, Montana. So, yeah. And Oscar Juniors, thank you for that gift sub to Contangel Arts. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Oscar Juniors. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Oscar. Yeah. It needed the extra reach. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tricorn says the Ineasaurus used its downward curved horn to hold onto a giant sword. Yeah, there you go. Bringing it full circle here, aren't we? Are we? Um. Yeah. Where did our Ineasaurus go? Come 
Come on, scroll wheel, you can do it. There we go. Aeneasaurus right here. Oh, very nice. Um, and Mayor Space says there are modern blacksmith YouTubers who make fantastically large swords for the purposes of fun and showing off, just like they did back in medieval time. And there you go. Just like these dinosaurs seem to have evolved these crazy cranial protuberances. Not necessarily for fighting, but for showing off. Yeah. Anyway. Well, that having been said, it's time to wrap up this broadcast. Here's an animal with some swords for teeth. There's Smilodon right there. That's big old fangs. This is our state fossil here in California. We'll run in the credits over this. Thank you, everybody, for another wonderful stream. Yeah. I appreciate you. Let's see who else is doing some... Uh, some science here on Twitch. Astro Canuck is live right now. Let's go raid into him. See what he's up to. No underscore. There we go. Thank you to everybody whose names are showing up here in the credits. I appreciate you more than you know. Thank you for keeping me here on the air. Thank you for furthering my mission of science outreach. It would not be possible without your help, so thank you very, very much for that. I appreciate you more than you know. I'll be back tomorrow for Thursday Birds Day, and Raisin Floof, I hope you'll join us tomorrow for Thursday Birds Day. Thanks for sneaking in that, uh, that follow just under the wire. And we're going to go right into Astro Canuck right now, who talks about space science. We'll go see what he's up to. So without further ado, thank you, everybody. I'll catch you later. Take care. Thanks again. <laughs>